and uh, welcome to the uh, June 27, 2020 uh, board retreat, uh, which was noticed as a special board meeting. Uh, and I would note that we originally uh, thought that when we scheduled this, we scheduled it far enough out that we thought we could attend in person, but that clearly is not possible under the current uh, COVID-19 uh, restrictions. So we decided to go ahead and do this, um, uh, do it on Zoom through a, a webinar. Uh, we decided that one full day of uh, a Zoom meeting may be too long. So we're gonna do half of it today and see how we do. And we uh, will probably do another half of the board retreat uh, later in August or September. So I'll call to order the, uh, the meeting and we will uh, begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Do we have a background available? Uh, yes, we do. Okay. So I will begin with I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag. of the United, United States, States of America, of America. And, and to the to Republic, the Republic of which is the one nation, one nation under God, God and indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice for all. I'll note for the record that all seven members of the uh, Board of Trustees are uh, present uh, this morning. Um, our first item is uh, public comment, and I understand we do not have any uh, public comment requests this morning, except for one that will uh, take place uh, just before item 4.3. This might be a good time to introduce Jasmine Tauson, who is our new administrative assist executive assistant and board assistant. No. So Jasmine, can you turn your camera on? Hi, Hello, Jasmine. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the uh, Santa Barbara Community College District Board of Trustees. Thank and you. Thank you for this opportunity. And I'm really excited to be here and um, be with the team here. We're, we're excited to have you. Um, look forward to uh, working with you on many meetings ahead. <laughs> As do I. Thank you. Thank so you, Justin. We, um, we begin this morning with, uh, with item 4.1, entitled SBCC Institutional Data, <coughs> excuse me, on student uh, performance. And uh, I believe that uh, Dr. Goswami will begin with a presentation of some uh, uh, data for us this morning. Sure. Good morning, trustees. Um, I will present some very high level data so that it can kind of you know, form us the basis for our discussion today. Uh, so what you have in the first slide is our student performance data over a period of time. Uh, I think from, uh, uh, let's see. all 2015 onwards till spring of 2020. Um, one of the, if there is a point to be made here, it is that uh, number one, we are a, a high performing institution. Uh, you will saw, see very shortly that our numbers are fairly high. But what is more critical for us to kind of you know, wrap our hand, hand around is that we seem to have hit a plateau. So it is, it's been stuck at 74, 75%. So- Is it possible that the, um, the graph could be enlarged? The numbers are very small and they tend to get fuzzy. No, the other way. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I, that's much better. I could, I could read it now. So, so we are kind of stuck at 74%, 75%. So that suggests that whatever we want to do from this point onwards to improve that, 
that will require some quantum changes in the way we do things. Uh, uh, the uh, strategies and, and methods that we have adopted over the last eight, 10 years to get us to where we are, uh, got us to here and it seems like we are hitting a ceiling and we need to uh, you know, find ways to do something more dramatic to make this make a change from this point on. And uh, by, by success, we mean uh, achievement of a degree or a certificate, is that correct? This is for course level success. Course level success, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Where does the data come from? From institutional databases. Our internal database? Yes. Okay. And where is that accessed? Through institutional research? Yes. Okay. Um, second, you can see very quickly that there is a distinct difference in, in uh, course modality in terms of success. Online success has been consistently lower over time. Uh, not much so when it comes to gender, but when it comes to ethnicity, there is there are a couple of you know outliers, uh, and one outlier being significantly significantly. Uh, uh, lower than the others is the Black and African American population, which is part of our uh, you know, subject of discussion to death resolution through the resolution 18. Uh, uh, so I want to dig a little bit deeper. Before you, before you move on, Dr. Goswami, just a couple things that I, I note on here. One is the spring 2020 numbers um, obviously not surprisingly indicate a, an increase in withdrawals. Yes. And that, that's the first time I've seen a number that they put a number on uh, how much, uh, how many students or percentage of students that we, we lost. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the uh, unsuccessful rate kind of correspondingly went down. Um, I guess that would be a factor of the the people we lost may have been the less uh, performing students. Right, but they, if you add if you add the two, they'll still add up to about twenty five, twenty six percent, which has been our norm. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the other it, thing uh, I noticed <clears throat> is that, um, at least to me, by looking at the graph, the given how quickly we had to shift to online instruction, the online. Uh, number down less than in person is not as much as I might have thought that it would be. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that shows that we we've, we've done reasonably well with with online instruction. Yeah. Under the um, circumstances. Can I also make a couple of thoughts? Sure. Um, the numbers there, the percents on institution wide success rate, are they by class? So we're talking about withdrawal from a class, not withdrawal from the college. From class. From a class. So we didn't so, actually necessarily lose those students so much as they took fewer classes. Uh, they, they withdrew from 4% more classes. Okay. And then the percent successful by gender and by ethnicity, mm -hmm. are we talking a particular modality or all modalities? All, all modalities. Okay. One of the things I've noticed in our um, data previously has been that we've also been stuck um, in the difference between success rates for uh, students with BOG waivers, which would be a, you know, a socioeconomic indicator mm -hmm. um, versus students without BOG waiter, waivers who do significantly better. And mm -hmm. so I think if we're talking about um, a, a significant um, quantum change, as you're suggesting, um, that's something I think we should be looking at as well. Yes. Uh, so, so if, if I can, uh, I have a cursor 
So this data can be manipulated based on semesters, course modality, type of course. It's not changing. No, it's not changing because it's a, it's a, it, it is not live data. Okay, I'm just pointing out. Okay. That, that we on, on basic skills and all no all kinds of courses, the kinds of courses, we can look at transferability. We can do by subject. So you can slice this data hundreds of different ways. Uh, but uh, as I'll mention, I'll point out a little bit later, that for us to be able to make a quantum difference from this point onwards, we have to go deeper into the you know, individual segments of the data to determine where the pinch points might be. Uh, next slide, please. So I think the one that I want to focus on is the is the, this this number. No, the next one. Yes. So this is a slide of our peer institutions and compared to us. And uh, it, it is part of your board packet, so you can spend more you know, time looking at it. So what I'm looking at here is that there are a number of institutions that we consider our peer colleges where the success rate of black and African-American students is significantly more than us. So therefore, so it suggests to me that there are ways in which we can do some things that can improve the success rate of the groups that are not doing very well at SBCC. <coughs> so, so there is there there is possibility of you know of adopting some best practices from other institutions for us to uh, be able to improve their performance of, uh, of some of the populations that are not doing very well here at SBCC. And Dr. Goswami, I believe there's a second slide that goes with this. That yes, there is, there is a second slide uh, if you, with additional colleges. So, Clyde, do you want to go to the, yeah, here, here are some of the other colleges that you know, that there is in our peer group. So one of the institutions that kind of stands out here is College of Canyons. So we, we will you know, examine some of this data more detail when we have when the CPC meets in a retreat. Plus I'm pretty sure the academic center is going to take interest in you know, looking at this data. Can I ask uh, Dr. Goswami, um, the do the, I mean, obviously uh, this, the system looks at this data, do the, um, <clears throat> Chancellors and superintendent presidents talk about this um, as as a high level group about um, practices at the colleges that are doing well, or is it up to individual colleges to kind of reach out to the ones that um, clearly are are more successful to you know get that inf information individually? Uh, there is not much conversation that happens at the CEO level that is beyond the very high level conversation. So, and the other part is that it's very difficult to establish causality as to what caused what. And, and now where we're getting to is that we want to establish some causality in terms of you know, data. Uh, so yes, there are occasionally, you know, uh, occasionally there is, um, pieces that you see published in the chancellor's office website. But those are things that are submitted by individual colleges that here is a good thing that we are doing. But from that, you cannot necessarily infer 
that's going to apply to this particular institution or some other institution. What, what occurs to me is that College of the Canyon seems to have uh, higher percentages almost regardless of, of yes. any group. So that, yeah. that would suggest to me that uh, there, there may be best practices as, a, as an explainer uh, yeah. or it could be great inflation that would serve to explain the, the same thing. Yes. And that would be so, worth examining. Yeah. That's, so that's why, you know, by looking at the comparative data across multiple institutions, you know, we can kind of, you know, try and take a, you know, deeper dive into what might be contributing to some of these you know, differences across institutions. What, what are we going to do to try to establish causation? What, what are our ideas on that? Uh, causality is very difficult to establish. Uh, uh, because the, the way we keep data in institutions, uh, statistically, it's very difficult to establish causality with the data kind of data that we keep. We need more granular data to be able to do that. Uh, but if we can match student characteristics with the characteristics of the, the interventions, then it's more likely to be a successful intervention. So not all interventions are, uh, you no, know, will address special characteristics. So we, so when we, for example, let's talk about Black and African American students. That's a high-level group, but they're not a monolith. There are a whole bunch of things happening within that group also. Uh, so. We have to match the intervention with the predominant characteristics that's causing disruption in, in education. Um, do we have thoughts of perhaps talking directly with students? I mean, our Black African American students, for example, and yes. talking to them about uh, what they think uh, an issue was or wasn't, you know, what worked and what didn't? Yes. Um, so, as I, as I mentioned, that you know, we probably have to do a kind of a different move to a different approach. Um, the best way I can describe the uh, approach to look at is that most institutional, and not just SBCC, but all over the country, most institutional access to or uh, approaches to student success has been very generalized to a population. To either ethnicity or gender or part-time, full-time status or some of those big things by which we report data. We have to go beyond the big blocks to find out what are the factors that is contributing or not contributing to each group. And when you do that, you'll find that there are many factors that might impact African-American, but they also impact another subgroup. And, and then you target your intervention to those groups. And, and our students with those characteristics. A good example is that in many institutions where you find that you know, some uh, uh, women in the 20s, late 20s and early 30s are not doing as well as others, uh, you can have a very generalized initiative regarding women in 20s and 30s kind of group, or you can look the underlying characteristics that's what's contributing to that. And what you'll find invariably that one of the factors that is contributing to that is that they also have young children at home. So therefore interventions that help that 80 or 90 students or 100 students who fall in that category is far better 
than a generalized approach to let's do something about women. So, so that's what I call that we, we have to probably move from a generalized approach to student success to a more personalized approach to student success. It will be this service to African-American or Hispanic or any other category to say, here, here's what it is for you. No, you have to look at, take a look at the students individually. Not all African-American students are succeeding because of the same reasons or not succeeding because of the same reasons. We can probably segment them into groups as to why, what is the major contributing factor to that, their lack of success and target our interventions that way, which means most of our intervention programs will not be aimed at 800 students or 1,000 students at a time, but most of the intervention programs will be targeted at 50 students here, 75 students here, 80 students here, 30 students here. But for those 30 students, that intervention is going to be life-changing. And that's where we need to get to, to, towards a more personalized approach to student success rather than a more generalized approach that most institutions have been taking so far. Dr. Gazwami, thank you for that. We, we have a couple of uh, questions and I did note for the trustees that we are using the hand raised uh, tab and I see that uh, Veronica is at the top of the list. Veronica, do you have a question or comment? Thank you, Robert, for acknowledging that I followed the rules and I raised my hand. <laughs> um, <laughs> <I don't think laughs> um, thank you, uh, Dr. Gazwami. I, um, I, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. And Peter, I remember about eight years ago in Ed Policies, you and I had a conversation about student characteristics. And at that time, I, I did my best to try to ex, um, articulate uh, how a student may come from the different, uh, even family makeup or, or gender or race, but how that student characteristic um, differed in the variability of the programs and services that we would offer. And of course, my background came from, you know, being a first grade reading teacher. And, and, and so anyway, I, it's exciting to me because there was so much work that we did around that table in terms of talking about how we get here. And, and it's almost been a decade. And if we're here now, then that's wonderful. But I was on a webinar yesterday with the International Reading Association and, and, and the researchers spoke similar to what Dr. Goswami is describing here to us. Of course, this is looking at early reading difficulties for young children, but it's a similar parallel thing going on here where not one thing's gonna work for one student um, and not all things that are good for one student are gonna be good for other students and vice versa. Um, specifically, I know the research that I've been following with regard to K-14 and the trajectory for reading success and certainly that reading um, success or lack of, we see it at the community college level um, so I think these ideas of really differentiating and personalizing the learning is where my heart goes. It's what students need, certainly California Community Colleges with the pipeline of students that we have. Um, uh, what then comes to mind is that these interventions are expensive. Um, they, you know, so I think that working in tandem as we flesh out this plan and Dr. Gazwami, I think you're, you're heading in the right direction. When I think of reading, for example, and you were talking about these different strategies, you know, there's different domains there. And so maybe a student has the comprehension when it came to, um, you know, a literature course that maybe they had some background knowledge, but now they're entering the disciplines of uh, whether it be the sciences or the social sciences, that lexile and level of uh, comprehension and background knowledge is going to require different support, especially for students that traditionally did not grow up speaking English. These students have had to catch up in words by the thousands by the time they got to kindergarten. And that gap just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you think of our local students, Peter, and I know we've talked a lot about this um, and Marianne, our local students, Black, African-American, you know, uh, uh, Hispanic, Latino, but even like Martian mentioned, students that are of low socioeconomic backgrounds, unfortunately, they never usually make up that word gap. Um, and so I think that these strategies um, it, I'll be excited to hear what the faculty says. This definitely hits on teaching and learning and pedagogy, which is where we know we need to go, developing the capacity of our classrooms, uh, professors, support staff to be uh, successful in that. So that's all I have to say about that in terms of that. I think it aligns with the research. It's where we need to go. 
at the same time, I know these things are expensive. The minute we target this type of intervention, it's expensive. But um, I think that uh, we can find creative ways to make that happen. So, so thank you, Dr. Waswami, for that. And I, I think that that's the road in the, in the right direction. And so that makes me excited. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Jonathan, uh, you're up next. Thank you. I think a lot of my questions were thankfully asked. I especially like the one of, you know, can we just ask the students why is this happening and let's just fix that. Um, makes a lot of sense because I think I think that's how any business would do its job is let's ask the people why is it not working for you and let's just address those things. But I think, you know, I want to learn more about the example that was given in terms of how we do the targeted intervention just because you know, I, I, like the, I, maybe the example given was not one that worked in my head because I was like, you say women in their 20s and 30s, and then you say women with kids. That's still a pretty big group. But I, you know, I, I still think that it shouldn't mean that we're not doing programs for all our Black students because there's a clear discrepancy. I mean, it's not subsects of the Black students who are doing poorly. It's all of, I mean, as a group, 58% to 74 as our institutional average, that's, that's terrible. Um, and I think we've known that it, that's this discrepancy has existed before any of us have been in this, in this field. So I don't know if it's just that, you know, what we've done in the last eight years hasn't worked. It's, it's never been a priority for the institution. And so I hear the issue with the money, but what is the point of this college, first of all, and, um, you know, we need to, if, if we want to fulfill our mission, I think we need to go there. Uh, so, and then 58%, we've known it's always been that bad. It's not like this is first time any of us hear this information anywhere. This has always been a problem, but now it's, you know, what are we going to do differently and not just differently in the actual like teaching approaches, but as an institution, what are we going to do differently? Like, if we, if we were a student and we were getting a grade in one of our classes 58 percent that means we fail as a whole still I mean usually an F can tank your entire semester's GPA uh, you'd lose your financial aid maybe sometimes depending on the school you're going to you'd really get hurt a lot as a student just for one semester getting an F we've been getting this for our history and so you know that would be that's I see that as a failure of the college that we're not spending our money right so I really like to hear more about how we're gonna solve that. I, I brought this up before, you know, when we had the joint meetings with the SBUSD, it's just a clear issue. One district to another, what are we gonna do different? Thank you, Jonathan. Mar Marcia, you're, you're next on the list. Yeah, so I apologize for interrupting earlier. I, when the, the um, data came on the screen, the hands thing disappeared. So oh, I didn't know okay. how to raise my hand at that point. Problem. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, two thoughts. One was, um, I agree with Jonathan, follow the money. I mean, uh, you know, our budget and what, how we spend our money is our most important policy here in how we have success. Um, I think uh, I would like us not to, to remember also that we have, when we fail to a 2% level with our Hispanic students relative to other institutions, that's a lot of students. So, you know, we should keep our eye on all of those places where we're not doing as well. And I think there were other ethnic groups down the list that we were uh, not doing as well as with our peer colleges. So. Um, I agree that our black and uh, our black students stand out, but there are other students there in, in significant numbers as well. And then finally, I would like to know from Dr. Goswami, institutionally, where will the responsibility for doing this work lie? Who is going to do that uh, kind of information gathering and analysis that we're talking about, including interviewing students? I think it, it, will be, it has to be a collaborative effort because it is not simply a, a, a academic matter or it's not simply a matter of saying it is only institutional research when you do this, or it's not simply a matter of you know, student services because there's an intersection of factors that affect academics, that affect student services, that affect other services and data. 
So it has to be a collaborative effort. So, so just like when it comes to a strategic plan, the entire institution works towards achieving those the goals identified in the strategic plan. Similarly, uh, you know, once we identify some of our strategies that we're gonna do as part of our strategic plan that we're gonna develop in, uh, in August, September, October timeframe, uh, it, it has to be an institution-wide approach. But doesn't someone have to take the kind of the, the lead responsibility in terms of, you know, you're going to put this together, you're going to help the institution see it? I think ultimately, ultimately you'll have to hold me responsible for making it happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, Craig, you have your hand up. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, I pretty much agree with, I, I agree with everything that's been stated so far. Um, yeah, but I, I think, I think that when we, when we look at the data, looking at statewide data can be misleading. Not that it's wrong, but it's from a different perspective. It's looking at the whole of the state. And when it comes to looking at just our college and colleges like us, there's different ways to say, we're, we are like them or they are like us when we compare ourselves to individual different college, colleges or institutions. Um, I, I use up for decades, I've used a different way of looking at this. I just look, I, I've studied demographics because it's how you market things. And there's some demographic some definite demographic um, similarities between us and other colleges, including College of the Canyons, but there are also some big differences. Um, there, like if you look at uh, Orange County, the college down there that we could compare ourselves to, there's some, there are a lot of uh, similar demographics and there are some very dissimilar demographics. Um, when we look at College of the Canyons, and I've looked at the demographics of that particular area that they that that college serves their district, um, not so much in the last 10 years, but prior to that, population was a little bit different, um, especially when you compared it to, uh, you know, central large um, population centers. Um, there are outliers of Los Angeles, a um, little bit different. Um, so I really appreciate the idea of, um, of looking at <clears throat> individual, small individual groups of students that, um, and really concentrate on socioeconomic backgrounds, um, in addition to being uh, black or brown or whatever. Um, or white, but because it's really critical to see just because a, a population is um, African American doesn't mean they're all in the socio same socioeconomic class. And so if you compare ourselves to College of the Canyon in that respect, that you we might find that the socioeconomic background of their African American students is quite different than the background of, of uh, African-American students here in our district. I'm not saying that I know this for a fact, but I highly suspect it based on decades of looking at, at demographics and being um, you know, somewhat familiar, at least as of 10 years ago, I was current on, um, on those differences. And um, so, I, I, I really, um, I, I think into the mix when we look at, we've got to do something and to do nothing means we're not going to improve. So we have to take some actions. So how do we do this? But let's in that mix, we've got to, to try to dig out any data we can get on um, the socioeconomic factors, you know, within the subgroup that we look at, because that's going to make a major difference in, in how effective what we offer um, can be, but I, I, we're on the right track. We have to do something. And the money is always, the, the budget is always an issue. 
um, that that's a really hard part as well, because if you take to find the, to put more money into one category, you got to take it from somewhere else. And because we're spending everything, there isn't any pot of money that we can divide up unless we create a pot of money to divide up. And to do that, we've got the we've got to discontinue some other programs at this point. So we have to do something. So this is a really important meeting. Veronica, oh, I'm sorry, Craig. Veronica, your hand is raised. And then after you, I wonder if we can go back to Dr. Goswami. I wonder if there's other data that you want to share with us. But uh, Veronica, if you could go first. Yeah, I just wanted to um, follow up on something that Jonathan said, and I wanted to clarify with Dr. Baswami. So the way I understood the, the intervention was a differentiated. So we are looking at the entire African-American Black student population, for example, but that what the strategies that we're using are going to be differentiated. So depending on what that student needs. And, and so I'm going to pause there because I think that the following slides gives us a number of students that we have at the campus. And I think based on what we have, I think it's, we can put, I would hope that working with our foundations and, and looking at the mix of our funding that we can uh, get this done. But Dr. Gozom, is that the way I understood it? We are providing this intervention. It's for everybody, it's, just, it's differentiated. We're not saying, no, you don't get it. And that's what differentiated intervention is, right? You get what yes, you mean. I mean, we are not excluding anybody, yeah. but certainly some interventions are more suitable for certain, no students with certain characteristics than other students. And so so it is not exclusively, you know, because student success ultimately is, you know, if you look at our mission, it's each and every student. So our focus is each and every student. And, and, we, and uh, wherever we find that students are not succeeding, we will try to improve. Uh, so so that's, that's where, uh, you no, know, but I was, or, Focusing on uh, African American because we're going to move on to the resolution 18, which you know, you know talks about that more. But but the context of this is student success for all students. So I, I want to share a couple of other slides just to give an idea of, of the way I'm thinking about uh, approaching this personalized approach. So again, if you enlarge this a little bit, trustees might have a better way of seeing it. So. Our student population, uh, we all know that we have, uh, we have, uh, no, we are, we have fewer students, but we significantly have significantly fewer African American students. Uh, so, as you can see, in 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 fall two thousand fourteen, we had seven hundred plus. African American students. We are now down to 370. And if you look at the where the loss has been the greatest, the loss has been the greatest in this area, which is rest of California, outside of Santa Barbara area. And here, the purple one, which is the out of state. Yes, we have declined in district, but not to the extent we have declined in other areas. So with, with the, so we have certain population of students who, whose representation in the college has declined much higher than the general decline in uh, enrollment. So it is, it is, if we don't pay attention to that, it will become an access issue also. Not simply a success issue, but it will become an access issue also. Could, could we move the graph up just a little bit so we can see the, yeah, the coding on the left there. Yeah, so we know what the colors mean. So, so the blue is in district where my cursor is. The dark green is Santa Barbara County, the um, kind of tan is the rest of California. Purple is out of state. 
and then the kind of you know, brick color at the bottom, that's international. Okay. So that's one observation that we are, I'm identifying that we have a, we very soon if you do, don't pay attention, we'll have an access issue also. So that has implications regarding how we market ourselves and where we market. But more importantly, you see the number 370? And you know that we are down by about 10% in success rates, 10 to 12%. 10 to 12% of this number is only 50 students. So that's where I was talking about in terms of, you know, so we know which, we know this, this is a small group of students and we, need, we should be able to identify what are the factors that are causing in individual stop, students from stopping out or not succeeding. That is the personalized approach. Think of this as just like in a, in a, in a classroom, if I have a class of 50 students, and I know that here are the eight, 10 students who are uh, not doing very well. As instructors, we manage those 10 students differently because we know, we identify as to why Sally didn't do very well and why Jim is not succeeding. Uh, we identify why, what is Alex's problem and so on and so forth. And we kind of you know, try to help, help students out that way. So think of this as we are teaching as an institution, this 370 students. And here are 50 students who are having problems. We should be able to figure out why those 50 students or 70 students are having, you know, what are their individual circumstances that are causing problems. So if you, if you deconstruct our data and see what needs to be accomplished, it should not be very hard. We, we have the resources, we just have not devoted the resources from that lens to look at students that their individual factors or collective of factors that uniquely impact each student as to why they're not succeeding. And I see you have one more yeah. uh, slide. Maybe we have a few other questions and comments. Yeah. Maybe we so, could go to finish that and then go to that. So let one. me go to the next slide. And this is a slide with uh, Hispanic students. And again, as you can see, we have dropped from about 7,000 to about 5,500. So the drop is not as significant, as great as the amount that we have seen in terms of the percentage decline in African-American students. But certainly in terms of number of students, it's much more, obviously it's a larger base. So here again, you see a significant component of rest of California contributing to it. And of course, we are not capturing as much as we could from the local area also. So again, marketing wise, slightly different strategy as to how we, we address the access issue for Hispanic students. So that's how we have to look at data individually. And then we try to, we have to match student characteristics with their performance. Now in our application forms, we do take in a lot of information. We can start from there, matching some of this information that we get in our application process with students who succeed versus students who fail, will fail and identify uh, some uh, criteria or, or factors that, are, that we can call critical success factors. Uh, so this is, I wanted to give you a broad overview of, of this part. And before we go to any questions, let me quickly cover some of the, uh, our, our demographics in terms of our so population in, of employees so that we have an idea of that. So Clyde, if you can do the PowerPoint slide quickly. So here is our ethnic composition of our employees. Uh, and 
you know, we will attach it to the you know, uh, minutes, this information. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see the Santa Barbara County versus SBCC students. Uh, so the area where we certainly can improve a little bit better is attracting more Hispanic students compared to the county. And we have been tracking our applicants for jobs, which we'll show in the next slide. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this is the employee, you no, know, same employee composition by various, uh, uh, that's the first slide that you saw, just the numbers behind it. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, so this is what we have attracted in terms of diversity in, term, in terms of our applicant pool. And, uh, and we have been proceeding over the last six months. Uh, we go ahead with the search only when we determine that the applicant pool is diverse enough. If the applicant pool is not diverse enough, then we will you know, open it up for one more round of applications and one more round of marketing. Okay. okay. Uh, Craig, your hand is raised or is that left over from before? Um, it's mostly left over, but I do have a question that for, I couldn't get to it to take my hand down and I couldn't find it to. Okay, so um, the numbers that we're looking at, are those uh, current enrollment numbers, are those applicable, are those from last year, like last fall, or is that what we have enrolled to date this year? Because I'm thinking it's last fall and our economic, our, our, the economic situation is a little bit different, is quite different now. Yeah, so so student numbers from last year, but the employee, employee applications, this, those are from January through June this year. Okay. So the applicants, we are, we are now tracking for every position what is the composition of the applicant pool before we make a decision to go ahead with, with the search and authorize interviews. Since we're not going to be doing a whole lot of hiring in the very near future, um, I know you have to, we have to pay attention to this and policy at the policy level. So um, that's fine, but I'm really concerned about the students and could, because that's really changed a lot and how, how we're going to react with Yes, clearly the, the trend is that we are losing significantly more African-American population yeah. and we are not attracting as many Hispanics as, as we could have based on the county demographics. Okay, I'll try to take my hand down. Thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan, do you have a comment? Forgot to turn off the mute, my bad. Um, I, I, I'd like to hear what we're doing now. Um, to be better about employee diversity. That's that's really great to hear, actually. I, mean, I think the diversity of the employees is not the entire answer, but definitely part of the answer on the student success and uh, access. You know, if, if they don't see the faculty reflecting, they might not even come in the first place um, is, is something to know. Um, and I, I do, I do want to name a couple of things. I did go on the graph and from 2017 to 19, our in-district and the California as a whole enrollment dropped six, dropped about the same amount. The, the values in 2019 are both around like 66% of the 2017 values. And you know, I think we just need to name and acknowledge that we obviously had a lot of issues on campus with regards to racism and our, you know, our black consuming issues that weren't going unaddressed and I think that's a clear one one reason why um, there 
has is the campus climate and you know no one wants to go to a school that they're not going to feel comfortable at and so i think we need to acknowledge that and you know make that a concerted if we want to re rebuild that enrollment um we need to do that and then with the latino students it is really focused mainly on in district i see that where the enrollment has dropped and again we have the promise program already and that is something i've heard recently is someone brought it to me is you know have white students benefited more from the promise program than latino students i don't know but i i told you know i think this data though shows that there is an issue where we have this greater level of access being provided but the enrollment's going down um, and so I think, th does that mean we need to also readjust that program and see how we can better partner with the foundation to bring that enrollment back? Because that enrollment coming back would be really big for our college budget. That's a thousand people or not a thousand, that's like 600 people still. Um, if we were able to work with the foundation to figure out modifications of the promise to make it more appealing to Latino students to bring them in, I think we, the college would benefit as a whole, our budget would benefit as a whole as well, and we'd be just doing our, our job better. Thank you, Jonathan. Marcia, do you have a comment? Yeah. Um, I was going to suggest that um, I appreciate the idea that it's, there may be an access issue in terms of the drop in um, elsewhere in California students uh, particularly for our black and African-American students. But I think there's another ex possible explanation that I, we ought to look at the data if that's possible. And that is that the promise programs have been growing in other communities. And so those students have a better access by staying with their own community college. I don't think it's an access issue if they don't come to us when we are not their community college. So um, I would hesitate to say that plus um, there are legal restrictions against recruiting in other districts, so I'm not sure how it matters that, you know, to marketing. Um, unless you have permission in the other district, you can't market their students. Um, so, uh, and then the other thing is, I was hoping we can revisit the numbers on the employee diversity and the student diversity and so forth, because we hadn't seen those before and when they flashed by this fast. Um, it's hard to get the information. So if we could come back to that in another meeting, that would be terrific. Okay, uh, maybe we can come back and show them again before we finish this discussion. Um, uh, Ver Veronica, you have your hand raised. Thank you, Robert. Um, I, I appreciate that Dr. Gaswami, the diversity pool of applicants. And that's something that when I, was asking around to different companies and certainly the Bay Area, a lot of the big companies, that's what the goal is, you know, because you want to make this also a legal, uh, make it legal when you're recruiting and hiring. And so the fact that you would want to throw the net wide and we have want to have a diverse pool, I think that that's a great um, thing that you're, the college is doing that we're tracking that. With regard to, um, you mentioned looking at the application, there's already a lot of data points there that we have, which I think is great. And this again reminds me of a question from eight years ago in Ed Policies with Peter. Um, we talked about, back then it was this idea of FERPA. And I'm wondering with regard to our local students, so we know some of the mitigation strategies that were put in place locally with our high school students, whether it was a second language acquisition, um, dual immersion students, special education, um, foster youth or single parent home, um, loss of income in one year, different things like that. The issue that uh, Peter and I came across was that we had FERPA. And so although our students were matriculating from the high school over to the college, there was no way for us to pick up the phone and say, make that connection with a counselor or that student. And so I just wanna throw it out there and maybe not, I don't need an answer. I don't, I don't know, think that this is an answer, but maybe if that's, if that's something that we have found um, that we can resolve. And also because of the recent growth in our PEAK program with our students um, through the Bauer Foundation. And that cohort of eighth grade students has grown over the years and they've been taking our courses after eighth grade. And one of the concerns from the Santa Barbara Unified School District was, um, you know, just that that um, transition over and that handoff. And, and, and it's not a criticism because actually the, the gal who oversees that Santa Barbara Unified 
has had a tremendous, um, wonderful relationship with Santa Barbara City College. So I guess I would just want to look at what what is it that we can do around FERPA so that when students are coming from the high school, what type of transition can we have? You know, that's legal because they're legally adults. We can't just call their parents. But there were a lot of programs in place that the foundations funded. I would think these folks want to see these students through. Um, another thing that I was wondering about was um, with this idea of students, um, the Hispanic the population declining, we've also had declining enrollment in our K-12. And I remember that report Lanny gave all of us, um, and Jonathan, I think you probably got it, Marcia. I'm not sure if you were on there yet, but we have it. The What I saw in the labor market, California uh, Labor Bureau is Santa Barbara County alone lost 20% of leisure and hospitality jobs. And so that's a lot of our Hispanic Latino families working in the service industry. So not only are we closing schools for these kids? Now we've taken away a lot of their jobs. And so we're going to continue to see a decline. Um, Santa Barbara Unified has certainly seen a decline in student enrollment and Kate, you can chime in probably from your time there, but that the economic situation here in town is going to have a huge impact on our Hispanic Latino families moving elsewhere. Um, and we'll have to see how that goes. I know that the enrollment, um, is looking different and we and we look at that when it, you enter kinder, kindergarten classes. So that's one thing. Uh, one thing I'd like to have us um, look into is that early dual enrollment. Uh, the, the district in the past has not been interested in working with us and that's um, something we've heard from the counselors. Dr. Benjamin had a really, really hard time getting a hold of then superintendent last summer. Um, and so we know that students that take a dual enrollment course are more likely to continue to enroll at Santa Barbara City College. So I just think that looking at those two different things, which is the FERPA, looking at what we can do for that handoff, uh, continuing to strengthen our dual enrollment programs and then looking uh, the college we also offer job training in that so we're looking at this as a multifaceted approach where we're looking at what we're offering to the families locally in terms of jobs and training and then um, what we're offering in terms of educational opportunities and access to our students um, and, and for my here Dr. Gozo I mean that's sort of where you're you're leading us which I couldn't agree 150 percent more that that is the right uh, way to go um, yeah thank you Robert Thank you, uh, Veronica. Kate, your uh, hand is raised. Yes, thank you. Um, and, I'll, and I'll follow on with Veronica's comments. I appreciate what everybody's um, been bringing up. I think the points are great. I think we do need to do everything we can both to attract more students, diverse students, diverse faculty and staff, and, um, and then have the programs in place to help them. I, but following on with what Veronica said, it's not just a Santa Barbara issue. In the 2010s, the K-12 population in California declined about one and a half percent over that decade. Um, in the 2020s, um, that's trending to decline about 7% over the decade. So um, there are just going to be fewer, fewer students coming out of the K-12 environment. I think that um, obviously we need to attract and serve those students, but we really also need to be thinking about um, the returning student and the student that needs the professional certification and um, also focus on, uh, on meeting those needs in the community. Thank you, Kay. I think that's a great point. Um, it, I think we do need to uh, keep the falling, the demographics of the reduced number of uh, uh, students, period. And uh, that is certainly a factor we have to uh, keep in mind. Peter yeah, it's a birth rate issue. Yes. Peter? Just a quick question, and, and it follows from Marsha's inquiry. Uh, will the graphs somehow be available to us after the meeting? So we. Yes, can... yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I don't know whether we we want to flash that graph again. They'll be available uh, later. I think they, they it is interesting and important information for us to uh, have in mind. Um, not seeing any other uh, hands raised. I think we're ready to move on to 4.2, which is really a continuation of the discussion we're having, uh, and that is a, a discussion of resolution number 18 
which affirmed our commitment for black and African-American students, faculty and staff. And we passed the resolution, I think it was June 25, in reaction to the George Floyd uh, uh, murder in, in Minneapolis and the, and the response and, and outrage to that, uh, to that killing. And our, I would note that our, our resolution identified, I think, was seven uh, specific items that uh, we're going to talk about today. I know there has been already uh, efforts made to move forward on a number of those. And uh, actually, one of the items was that we would have this on our agenda for our retreat today, as we do uh, to discuss uh, in depth. And with that, I'm going to call upon several uh, constituent leaders on campus to give us their uh, views on item 4.2. I believe we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, presentations. And our first one will be from Rayanne Napoleon, chair of uh, the Academic Senate. So good morning, Rayanne. Hi, good morning. Good morning. All right, is it okay if I get started? Yes, you're on. Excellent. All right. Get my comments here. I wanted to make sure I didn't ramble too long. So I, I have them written this morning. You so, are so prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you when I finished them then, Dr. Goswami. <laughs> Um, good morning, trustees and Dr. Goswami. I want to begin by thanking you all for not only inviting the various constituency leaders to this meeting to have a moment to reflect on Resolution 18, but also for the commitments that Resolution 18 makes. Being the Academic Senate President, I want to take just a moment and remind everyone that Title V codifies the Faculty Senate as an organization whose primary function is to make recommendations regarding professional and academic matters. And I feel very strongly that Resolution 18 includes many professional and academic matters for faculty. With this in mind, I'd like to share where the Senate can support the board in this important work. Would the first and last be it resolves, the first one stating that the board does hereby condemn police brutality and affirm that Black Lives Matters. I want to mention that at our July 15th Senate meeting, Ann Redding from the School of Justice Studies provided a presentation that not only included the history of their department and ways that they've been working for decades to provide holistic education for our students in administration of justice classes, but also she started her pre presentation condemning police brutality in all of its forms and declaring Black Lives Matters. It is important to realize that our own School of Justice Studies, led by both Ann Redding and Dave Saunders, with contributions from many part-time instructors that also work in our local community, share these sentiments. With this in mind, I hope that all of the Board of Trustees know that there is no conflict of interest in declaring Black Lives Matters, and that there should be absolutely no hesitation in condemning police brutality unequivocally. For the second and third, be it resolves, I'd like to remind everyone that this is going to take an incredible collaboration between the board, student services at SBCC, as well as the faculty body. One way to support this work and ensure it's productive is to provide direct resources to it. And by resources, I mean money. I am keenly aware of the budget worries we have at this time. So I know we are always looking for austerity measures, but if we are really committed to this work and this resolution says that we are, know that we must be, <clears throat> know there must be clear support for it with our hearts and our money resources. And we do not, and we do have an excellent student success program that supports black students in ways that the resolution mentions, such as Emoja. Please make sure you are partnering with them, not only to provide resources to them, but also to center black students and professionals that are already doing this work. The faculty, as indicated by the questions asked of me to address the board with for the June meeting, will be pleased 
for um, will be pleased if the fourth be it resolved that says that you will all be giving quarterly reports on progress made to resolve concerns and focus on the 2019 campus climate survey. The climate survey, although painful, is an essential snapshot of morale on campus. The Academic Senate has its own retreat session scheduled to revisit this and to determine where the Senate can take the lead on certain things. We cannot just move, move on from where that survey, excuse me, we cannot just move on for that survey illuminated painful details we must tend to it, even though some time has passed. I said in my May 14th board presentation when presenting my Senate president's vision that I will be championing a safe, accessible and actively inclusive campus climate. We aren't opening the door for bad things happening to us as a campus by recognizing that terrible things are happening to people on our campus. We are making sure that people know that we will not tolerate terrible things happening to people on our campus. And the most important people, of course, is our students. I will now conclude my comments with the reminder that our work must center Black voices and include them every step of the way, and that we are declaring Black Lives Matter. And that should mean that their lives don't matter just when something goes awry on campus or nationally in a reactive manner, but that they matter every day on our campus. This resolution is a step in the right direction. We're living that out at SBCC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marianne, for those uh, comments. And we look forward to working with the uh, Academic uh, Senate on this really, really important uh, issue for, for all of us. Um, I'm next going to call on uh, Liz Auschenklotz, Chair of the Classified Staff. Liz, are you with us? Okay, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, I wanted to start with a statement that came out of our executive committee of our, um, this is of our union. We met uh, last week. We usually don't meet in the summer, but this was special. Occasion, we're working on our work group that the membership directed us to do. And with all due respect to the board, CSEA supports this resolution completely, but we're disappointed that it didn't pass unanimously. I need to pass this on from our entire executive committee. We're disappointed that uh, uh, board member Nelson and Harada weren't able to support it. And we hope that going forward, that any uh, decisions the board makes, they will be able to support. So I just needed to get that out in all honesty. That's the way that, uh, that we're feeling about it. But we do support the resolution completely. A lot of things Rayanne said, uh, I don't need to go over again. Some of our members, a particular uh, further resolve clause that had to do with the collaboration with uh, partners in K-12, higher ed, the foundation, we really are interested in hearing what the board comes up with the plan. Today, I was really uh, enthusiastic about the personal approach to student success. I think that's really important to find out where the gaps are, but you really have to do it as you've already stated with individual students. Any other way that, you know, you just get them as a group and everybody's got their own issues. So I think it's very important that, that you're looking into that. I'll just conclude that we're very hopeful that the board will continue on with this work. We're very supportive of it and we're willing to do whatever we can to assist in uh, the furtherness of this work. Thank you. Liz, uh, thank you for your comments and, uh, and support. Um, we uh, are next going to call on Jason Walker, who's chair of the uh, ALA. Jason, are you... Uh, are you with us? Yes, good morning, Board of Trustees, President uh, Goswami. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, yep. we can, thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to be able to speak on behalf of the ALA, the Advancing Leadership Association. Uh, we too are also in support of the board resolution 18 that was passed. 
and I'd like to read a uh, statement that was prepared by our ALA. In November 2019, all managers participated in a mandatory resource training with a representative of SAVE, focusing specifically on the 2019 climate survey. As a result of that meeting, the ALA developed a work group at the recommendation of Interim Superintendent President Dr. Helen Benjamin to respond to the issues expressed in the survey. In June, the ALA sent a letter to SBCC staff and faculty, and in that letter, recommitted to our goals of addressing the climate survey. As stated in the letter, the Advancing Leadership Association, ALA, stands with our Black students, staff, faculty, and community members, as well as our entire SBCC community, in denouncing any and all actions of racial injustice. Racism, racism is real, and the harm it causes is real. Racism exists in our institutional practices and in our individual interactions, and we, as leaders of SBCC, are committed to ending such injustices. The letter goes on to read, the LA's mission states, as a team, we support our college community to create and uphold and welcoming learning environment through collaboration and high expectations for the success of our diverse student population. Our first and immediate step is to reconvene our ALA climate survey work group that was established, was established in November of 2019 to identify measurable goals that we can take as managers. This work will include addressing the concerns that were expressed in the survey to meet the California Community College's call to action. This work will be in collaboration with our fac black faculty, staff, and students We'll also work together with our ASG, CSEA, Academic Senate, and the administration. To you, our staff and faculty would commit to working to develop our capacity to take meaningful action to eliminate, eliminate institutional racism, to continue learning and listening, to hold individuals and our institutional accountable, and to leverage our institutional resources in the community. During the winter of 2019, our group discussed our charge and ideas, met with Dr. Goswami to update him and explored the ideas of facilitating healing spaces through SAVE. At our request, a representative of SAVE conducted training at the all campus service, spring in service in January of 2020 on the power of words. In June, we recommitted to our work and expanding our committee membership to include 15 managers from across disciplines, both instructional and student support services. Subsequently, we onboarded new committee members in June and discussed moving forward with training opportunities, retreats and workshops for managers. Specifically, <coughs> looking forward, the LA is developing a menu of courses offered through non-credit that focus on concerns raised in the climate survey, such as anti-racism, communication, diversity, and organizational change. Additionally, as previously scheduled, the ALA will participate in a half-day training on improving the employee evaluation process also, process, also recommendation in the climate survey. Later in the fall semester, the ALA will also conduct a mandatory training with SAVE to further development department-specific healing spaces and address concerns and needs around the issues of anti-racism that are unique to managers at SBCC. So again, I just wanna reaffirm uh, our support um, for the board's resolution 18 and our commitment to stand in solidarity uh, for black students, staff and faculty with the board and SBCC community. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And uh, thank you to uh, the ALA for their a uh, commitment uh, on uh, resolution uh, number 18. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our next uh, presentation this morning is from uh, Cornelia Alzheimer, chair of the Faculty Association. Good morning, honorable members of the Board of Trustees, President Miller, Dr. Goswami, am I on? Good morning, Cornelia, you are on. 
Um, thank you so much for having me this morning. First and foremost, the Faculty Association wants to express our wholehearted and full support for the board's goal and commitments outlined in resolution number 18. You have reached out to us to learn about the thoughts and ideas from the faculty bargaining unit on how to achieve those goals, specifically to remove barriers and increase the educational success of our black and African-American and other disadvantaged students. I would like to share today a few recommendations you might want to consider. Our students deserve to have faculty members who they can identify with, can learn from, and look up to. Therefore, we need to attract more faculty members that are people of color, full-time and part-time, non-credit and credit. This goal should drive any changes to our board policies and procedures, namely our BP and AP 7120, which direct faculty hiring. And for a start, that goal should be clearly stated in the first paragraph of both document, the BP and the AP, with the AP then making specific suggestions on how we can achieve this goal. It appears that more specificity is advisable. As an example, the paragraph recruitment in the current policy version is exactly one sentence. Let's add specific steps on how we can design an intentional recruitment process that will encourage more persons of color to apply for our faculty positions. Starting with simple things like where to advertise. It very clearly is not enough to just place a notice in traditional publications such as the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Also, let's offer all applicants travel stipends to come to the interviews. If we really want to attract a diverse applicant pool, we cannot let the cost of an airplane ticket stand in their way. Providing this financial report support sends a message to potential hires that SBCC is a place where they will be valued. Secondly, Let's make sure that applicants of color feel welcome when they are walking into the interviewing process. The best way to do so is to have people of color as committee members and preferably more than just one. Consider allowing part-time faculty on hiring panels. They can provide extremely valuable input and they will diversify the committee composition. But please, do not forget to provide for compensation for their work. Make an effort to have the EEO representative on the committee be a person of color as well. This all will help guide us towards creating a more diverse, equitable and inclusive hiring process. On another important note, in the currently ongoing revision of the faculty evaluation procedures, the FA would like to affirm our commitment for the need to focus on equity and diversity in the evaluation process, as well as mentoring and supporting newly hired probationary faculty. In addition to the significance of faculty hiring and support, the FA wants to emphasize the importance of diversity, equity, and anti-racism training for all members of the campus community. Recent trainings, webinars, and presentations from within the college, the Chancellor's Office, and others have been very valuable and will hopefully continue. The FA is supportive of these efforts and would like to see this anti-racism professional development training continued. We are confident that you, the board, is equally supportive. Thank you very much for dedicating your retreat today to this important topic. Thank you, Cornelia, for your comments and uh, suggestions. Uh, we, we appreciate you taking the time to uh, share them with us this morning. Uh, our next uh, presentation is from uh, Akil Hill, Chair of the Black uh, uh, Faculty Association. Akil, are you uh, with us?
Akil, I see you're you're on. You're you're muted. If you could unmute. For some reason, we're having uh, difficulty getting uh, Akil uh, live with this. Why don't we uh, go to? Why don't we come back to Akil and go to Carson Mitchell from the uh, uh, chair of the ASG? Is are you with us, Carson? Um, I don't see Carson. Akil, are you able to unmute yourself? I see that you're connected otherwise. I'm reaching and also, out to, uh, I'm unmute reaching to Akil right now, uh, seeing if I can't get a hold of him. Okay, maybe, well, maybe we can, if Carson, I see Carson has joined, we can go to Carson. Uh, Hello. Carson, you are, you are on. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me at your retreat. Uh, I understand how atypical circumstances are right now, so your accommodation is much appreciated. Um, I'd like to start by saying uh, the ASG, first and foremost, recognizes the need for and unequivocally supports Resolution 18. Um, you know, we can wholeheartedly and confidently confirm and reaffirm that Black Lives Matter uh, and will continue to matter on this campus. Um, and in order to implement those goals, the ASG has uh, adopted a few viewpoints that we thought would be important to bring to the board's attention. Um, and so our goals basically start with having the uncomfortable yet necessary conversations that need to be had uh, to address the real reality of our climate on campus. And so ways that we intend to do that is we want to start by eliminating color blindness. Um, I guess the best way I can elaborate on that is you know, as, as a white person in the United States, uh, we've kind of been able to grow up on this notion that we don't see color and, and everyone is equal, but that's a privilege that we, we've been uh, afforded as American, as white Americans in this country. And that is not a privilege that people of color in this country have. They, they cannot afford, you know, to not see color when they are systemically treated differently for the color of their skin. And so having those conversations as white people uh, is one thing that I think, you know, is one uncomfortable to have, uh, but is so incredibly necessary to addressing, you know, our points of privilege, where we're coming from and how we can address student needs. Um, so I think the next step in that regard is amplifying voices of color. I've noticed from my time on ASG uh, and tuning into other committees, it's very easy to make time for someone, but it's different to see someone actually listening. And so I, I definitely want to incorporate uh, more of a mindset of, you know, this is student guided. This isn't us, you know, this isn't the, the few people who are on the ASG making the decisions. We really want this to be run by the students who populate this, this campus. And, uh, you know, I individually, I'm not representative of all of them. And so um, a few things have come to my attention in that regards that I would like to address. Uh, first, it's come to my attention that there has been a committee created addressing uh, equity within board policies and administrative procedures, and uh, I've heard that there's a need for student representation on that committee. Uh, I want to make sure that there is a voice of color on that committee. I want to make sure that, you know, the students who are going through those, those crucial board policies are students from the populations who this is targeted to benefit, you know, as eager as we are to just say, we'll hop in, take all the responsibility, do whatever's necessary. That's, you know, not right, not equitable. And we're not giving the right students the voices that they deserve. Um, another thing, and uh, I definitely don't need to point this out to you all, but uh, there is an absence of a student trustee. And uh, we are definitely working very diligently to get applications set up and to get these positions filled. But one of our, you know, top priorities mm -hmm. is reaching out to UMOJA, the Black Student Union, uh, we want to see an African-American or Black student trustee um, just to bring that voice of color and representation onto the board. And a couple other things before I keep rambling and, and taking up your time is uh, we want to expand data collection efforts. You know, it, it's one thing when faculty and administrators reach out to students, but uh, collecting data 
you know, from students by the students may change the responses we get, uh, may change, you know, the, uh, for lack of a better word, comfort students have in addressing difficult situations they face on campus. Uh, we're, we're figuring maybe they'll be uh, more receptive to opening up to a student. Uh, fortunately, we have some some math friendly minds on the ASG, so we're looking forward to, uh, you know, continuing our studies and implementing some some statistics and uh, hopefully being able to contribute to the data on this campus in a productive way. And one other final thing uh, is we want to direct our programs and initiatives towards historically underserved students. Um, and, you know, because of current circumstances, we obviously can't have any events or activities uh, that we would typically throw. And um, this is an opportunity we really want to utilize to create the largest possible benefit for our students. So we really want to direct our budget this year towards scholarships, financial aid. Um, you know, we want to really target uh, remnants of housing and food insecurity. And we want to make sure that everyone is on an even playing field when given access to these opportunities, because regardless of how hard we try from an administrative end, you know, if we're not giving the students the tools they need to succeed, uh, the idea of equity is thrown out the window. Um, so those are a, a few of the main uh, initiatives we're taking up as a part of the ASG this year. I hope, you know, the board will consider some of these viewpoints and uh, maybe take them to heart when going over policy. Um, but yes, I, I would just like to conclude by restating that we unequivocally support uh, Resolution 8. 18. Uh, we will continue to reaffirm that Black Lives Matter and will matter uh, on this campus and in the United States of America. Um, and we are very eager and up to the challenge to addressing the equity and inclusion issues that we're facing on this campus today. So thank you for allowing me to address you. Carson, thank you very much for your uh, comments and your uh, suggestions on how we can fulfill our commitment to uh, the commitments that we've set forth in uh, resolution uh, 18. Um, oh, there, and I see Akil. Okay, we've got him now. <laughs> okay. Welcome, Akil. Um, I'm, I'm not hearing you, but I don't see that you're. Can you hear me? I'm here. Not hear you. Okay, good enough. Okay, Great. well, welcome uh, <laughs> again. Akil is uh, chair of the Black. Uh, faculty association and uh, we appreciate you taking the time to address us about resolution number 18 this morning um i do have to apologize i didn't re realize that i was uh, slated to to speak so when you called on me i just was actually sitting here and full disclosure i was wearing a tank top and then i kind of freaked out <laughs> so i had to run upstairs and get changed so but um i just well, want to uh thank you guys uh for giving uh, us a moment uh, uh, of your time to discuss this. Um, first of all, I would like to say, I wanna thank you guys for passing resolution 18 uh, on behalf of uh, BFSA. Um, and uh, we are looking forward to working uh, with the board as well as with the institution of trying to move things forward. Um, I just wanted to um, say that we have a few things already in play. Um, the, and we've had a lot of support, uh, Dr. Goswami, from Dr. Goswami um, as we continue to try to push forward uh, these um, ideas and issues so we can have the most, um, just make the institution better, I guess is, is, is where I'm coming from. I think that um, BFSA um, loves Santa Barbara City College. It's an honor and a pleasure to work for the institution. Um, and as well as, um, you know, we have to hold the institution accountable on the on the areas that we think that we can improve. So we can stand in the same place simultaneously um, and wanting, um, recognizing the good that the institution has done as well as being critical of the institution uh, to, to, to make it better and equitable for uh, black and African-American students. Um, so um, that's uh, pretty much where we stand on it. Um, we will continue to have a courageous conversations uh, with the institution and sometimes we may not agree on it, but uh, we will we work from a place or come from a place of uh, mutual respect and love. And, and that's what we hope for. That's what we generally hope for is um, holding our institution 
accountable to the mission statement that it, um, that it, it says itself to be. So that's what we're about. Um, and um, we're looking forward to rolling up our sleeves and doing some heavy lifting and, um, and moving things forward. I believe Cornelia was talking about hiring um, black, more black uh, faculty and staff. And, and uh, this is um, absolutely uh, true that we do need um, one of the reasons why students have success is they, they can see themselves in places, meaning in, in staff positions and faculty positions. And, and, and so what we are really hoping for is by being out on the forefront or, or um, that will naturally attract people of color to want to apply. Yes, it's important and it's critical that we go out and we actively engage in spaces where um, black professionals are um, but as well as by changing the culture on campus, that will also ensure that uh, people of color will want to apply. Um, and so there has been some changes with the emoji space. Um, I think we're centering them on the center of the campus. Um, so um, that, so we can be visible in places um, that we were once not before. And so, um, you know, that's that's just some of the ideas and thoughts that BFSA have. We want, obviously, um, more Black um, faculty and staff, but we also want the those who are extremely qualified, too, you know, and so it's important to, to, to mention that as well, is that um, we want the best of the best. We should, uh, at Santa Barbara City College, we should be wanting the best of the best because uh, that's what we're trying to be. We want to be on the forefront of things. and. And BFSA is, is committed to doing the work with the institution to accomplish that. Thank you, Akil, um, for, your, uh, for your comment this morning and, and joining us. And we're looking forward to working with you to, to uh, see that we can fulfill the commitments that have been made in uh, resolution number 18. I know you're already involved and we'll uh, continue to need your your involvement and your group's uh, involvement uh, in particular as we uh, as we move forward. So thank you again. Yes, and uh, hopefully we can um, <laughs> uh, get something on the books where um, you know we can schedule something with BFSA and, and the board, and, and so we can kind of dole in a little bit deeper with everyone. Um, and like I said, I was a little bit caught off guard, so I wasn't as prepared as I would have liked to have been, but. By all means, I, I think uh, you guys hear my message and my point. And um, Dr. Uh, Goswami has already um, been supportive of us. Um, and so we hope to get some good work done and um, be the place that that beacon where we, um, where other institutions can look to us and say, look what we've been through um, and they, we've turned it around and, um, and, and understand that it's coming all from a place of love. And that means that having courageous conversations with people that don't believe that racism exists. Um, my, our mission is to focus on the people that do and who are support us and we work with them, uh, the other people and they, that don't really necessarily see it the same way that we do, then we just say, okay, we have a difference of opinion and those who are with us, we're, we're welcome, come to us with the open arms, we embrace you with the open arms and let's get some work done. So thanks again, sorry for the mix up this morning. So no worries. No worries. I was glad I was in here, though. <laughs> We're glad we, uh, we got it worked out. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Okay, thank you. So next, uh, uh, Dr. Gaswami, I, I think we should go to you before we go to uh, trustee comments and questions, because uh, you, you've obviously been working on this uh, ever since uh, we passed the resolution in June. And I think you want to share with us uh, work that's been done and your ideas for moving forward, so. Sure. Uh, uh, Clyde, if you can put the resolution up uh, on the screen. One uh, second. I think it would be best if I go through the each of the components of the resolution uh, so that you know, trustees have a feeling for you know, where we are and what we are planning to do and then uh, you know you can provide your insights and input uh, as we end up developing a formal plan sounds like a good approach thank you yes <laughs> so the uh, The first, be it for the result, which is at the bottom of this page, 
We might have to enlarge it a little bit. Okay, now scroll down to the bottom. All the way down. Yes, that one. No, 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 not that, not that far. Right there. So this is the first uh, uh, bead resolve. Uh, and this talks about a collaborative approach to identify and remove barriers and uh, use our resources for student success. Uh, I mean, nothing could be more fundamental to the institution than this. Uh, I had already mentioned at the, at the beginning when we discussed data that we have to move when it comes to barriers and success factors. People tend to uh, uh, focus a lot, lot on the barriers. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that removing a barrier will lead to success. Uh, in some cases it will, in some cases it will just, you know, um, open the door, but doesn't mean that it's going to carry the person through the door. Uh, so both barriers and, and critical success factors. And uh, as I indicated, institutionally, if we're able to impact 300 students, our success rate is going to be much higher than where it is now. So we are going to have conversations with, with the faculty because as they indicated that a lot of the things that needs to happen are in the ballpark of faculty. Uh, it is their responsibility through Title V as to how they would initiate certain things but I'm going to, we will have conversations with faculty and then staff and, and students uh, to do this in a methodical and structured way. We'll look at data and probably we'll look at data from a big data perspective. Uh, we have, we collect a lot of data, but we have not spent much time or haven't had the ability to spend much time looking at all the data that we collect. So by looking at both internal and external data, we will hopefully identify some of those uh, things that are both barriers and things that are critical success factors. And then uh, target our incremental dollars to those initiatives. So, that's the plan that we have. Uh, hopefully we will, uh, it will be ongoing process. It is, it is, it never ends <clears throat> because student bodies change, student populations change. So just because you succeeded this semester doesn't mean, you know, your class is gonna be the same as last semester's class. Uh, similarly, every year our student body is gonna change a little bit. And uh, as long as we're committed to success of each and every student, we will have to keep doing this work of continually identifying how we can improve success of our students. So you can expect kind of a first uh, update from us sometime around October. And then later on when we discuss uh, the board agenda calendar for the items, we will you know, pencil in a specific timeline throughout the year so that we can hear updates from the institution regarding how it's progressing. Uh, next, if you sc scroll up a little bit, we can go to the next resolutions. So the second resolution um, talks about dedicated resources, including counseling and financial assistance uh, we have already had conversations. I've already had conversations with the BFSA and uh, we will look at ways in which we can dedicate some of our existing resources to that endeavor. And, and later on, as we open up more positions, how to target some of those positions to support this 
uh, initiative. Uh, one of the things that always kind of, you know, I thought it was kind of odd when I got here was that the Mojo Center was somewhere on West Campus, not in the middle of things. And I kept saying that now, unity in the middle of things. And, and uh, so now, uh, very soon, I think they're in the process of moving now, where they will be actually in the, in the campus center, where they will be centered uh, on the campus. And so the students now, what I say is that if you're a student in this campus, you should claim this campus as yours. And by being centered in the campus, I'm hoping that uh, they will have more visibility and influence in what, how things happen in the campus. Um, the third item is simply a matter of an agendizing you know, the reports that we'll provide to the board. And uh, we will agendize it in the board agenda. And then we will, you know, it's not necessarily simply a report from the administration. I hope that I'll include, I'll be able to include various groups as to what they're doing also. Because uh, changing culture is not simply administration doing something. Changing culture is all of us are doing some things. And we need to hear from all entities as to how we are working on that. Uh, the next one deals with you know, the kind of a fairly, uh, uh, I would say, ambitious goal on the part of the board that we will be able to review our board policies and procedures, uh, sorry, to improve the campus complaint process. Uh, I actually confused the fifth one with the fourth one. Fourth one is straightforward uh, to straighten or to improve the campus complaint process. And we have already made uh, significant strides on that in terms of streamlining how various complaints go to which entities. Uh, so now at least when it comes to complaints of uh, <clears throat> discrimination and things of that sort, there is a single point of contact and there is commitment on the part of administration that the person who files a complaint will receive periodic updates regarding what is happening with the complaint. and and will also get final notice of you know, how it was disposed when it is disposed. So yeah, uh, number four will be, you know, we will accomplish it within a few months uh, before the end of fall. So that part will be done. Uh, the fifth one is the one that was more ambitious in looking at all the board policies and procedures from the anti-racist and equity lens. That is going to be a, a significant amount of work. Uh, so I've already thought about how best to proceed. Uh, um, we already have a group in campus, a shared governance group, BPAP, that does board policies and procedures. Uh, I felt that to put the entire onus of the figuring out what is anti-racist and what is an equity lens to that group will detract from the normal day-to-day -day work that the group has to do. So my approach is going to be that we will create a separate task force uh, comprised of board members, faculty, staff, administrators, and students to methodically go through the board policies and identify which policies may be problematic and why, and possibly offer some language as to how it can be addressed. And once that work is done, we'll pass it along to BPAP for them to go through the normal shared governance process of developing the policies and procedures and bringing it to the board when they're ready. So, so the part of identifying the problematic policies and procedures will be done by a task force uh, with representation from all constituents, including the board. 
the uh, <clears throat> first task of this, and this is where I'll be very interested in hearing from board members regarding the notion of what would be an anti-racist and, and what would be an equity lens. So some of your thoughts about what that could be would be important because this is not simply conceptual, this is something that has to be operational so that we can we can evaluate policies on the basis of some of that. Obviously we'll have, we'll have input from faculty, staff and other groups also, but I'd like to hear you know, input from the board also in terms of what is the lens we are going to use to assess our policies and procedures. Um, the next one, uh, It's very similar to the very first one. Uh, uh, this expands our collaboration with other entities regarding eliminating the gaps, with some of which we already you know, briefly talked about at the opening slides regarding student performance. Uh, one of the things I'm becoming increasingly concerned about is because of where we are right now in terms of online education uh, not just at SPCC, but also uh, throughout the school districts. Uh, college students at least have some familiarity with online instruction. Uh, most grade, stu grade school students and, and high school students generally don't. So for them, this, the move has been a shock to their system of how they have usually learned. So there is, there is a great possibility that we, the 2021 may be the year of loss, where we have lost one year of learning. And, uh, and two years down the road, those students will come back, come to us may be deficient in many things. So I would like to, as part of this resolution also, uh, this part of the resolution, initiate conversations with our K-12 partners to see what kind of you know, bridge programs we can put in place proactively starting this year so that we're able to minimize the disruption that is taking place, not just at, for our college students, but so also to the students who will potentially come to us a year from now or two years from now. So to me, that will be a, a important component of this uh, uh, element also. Um, the next one talks about uh, that we are gonna discuss this at the retreat and we already are doing it. And the final one is, 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 is to have the conversation that Akhil talked about uh, and, and the ASG talked about in terms of having difficult conversations. Uh, so thinking is we will have a series of conversations in the fall, uh, perhaps some, some external panel that we invite uh, uh, people who are familiar with you know, national and, and state uh, landscape and have a panel of those speakers with our faculty, students, and staff, and students participating in Q and A's, and then also have an internal panel, or maybe a series of internal panels of, of folks within the campus to have those conversations. So I don't see this as a one-time and you're done kind of approach, but we will have several of these uh, colloquia, as, as we say, as we say uh, throughout the fall semester and perhaps in spring uh, to, to tease out uh, things that we are able to do and that needs to be done and that is the highest priority among our uh, student body and, and, and employee base. So with that, uh, I've shared a little bit about some of our initial thoughts about how we will proceed on this board resolution. 
uh, it's you know it's it'll be interesting and helpful if I hear if we all hear some of the thoughts the board members have on on these various items. You're muted. Hi. Do I get to go first? Okay, go ahead, Craig. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what if you said well, for let, someone else. Let me. I just had a couple comments, Craig. But let me, oh, my, go ahead. It's I all right. Muted. I'm just going to say, Dr. Goswami, uh, uh, we passed this resolution in in June, and I think we're all pleased that we we're moving, and we have been moving almost since the day the resolution was passed, and there are so much work to do, but uh, the process has begun. And uh, it, it was really good to hear from all the constituent leaders uh, today and get their input. So uh, it's going to be, uh, I think, a very, a very uh, productive fall and continuing. It's obviously won't, won't be done at the end of our, our fall semester, but uh, we have a lot of work to do, and we appreciate you outlining uh, some of your thoughts and ideas now to move forward. Craig, you had a comment or question? Yeah, I put my hand up early, and um, and I listened uh, very carefully to what all of the um, uh, speakers had to say, and uh, I'm very pleased. Um, so I had a couple of comments because one of the first comments made and um, today was concerns that to me say that they're concerned that the board will not act as a whole after a decision that was made. When the board votes, then it is our duty to follow through and act as a whole in order, to, in order, in other words, to proceed with the motion because that is the board's decision. One of the reasons why why many votes are not uh, that are not unanimous by the board is because sometimes we're up against a deadline. We've had insufficient opportunities to to um, to participate in the formulation of what we're voting on and how it's put forth. Um, so in this case, uh, we kind of missed a step as we do oftentimes to uh, get things done in a quick manner. Um, so instead of having, uh, you know, we got something in front of us, we were asked at one meeting to make suggestions or get little changes accomplished, and then right away vote instead of it coming back again. And I, I can fully understand the reason for going forward. I think that uh, shouldn't put too much emphasis on the fact that this that the decision was not unanimous. Um, in fact, over the past years I've been on this board uh, and interviewing people that want to be on the board or are thinking about participating on the board. Um, one of the um, one of the red lights that often comes up that's maybe that's a bad term to use. Uh, but one of the points of consideration um is that uh you know the idea that the board needs to act as a whole um for people that are offering to serve on the board have said well if i missed the if the vote didn't go my way i would keep working for it and keep pushing for it and you can't that's not the way it works the way it, the way it needs to work in order to work is once the board's voted then it needs to act as a whole. So I'm speaking as this trustee, I'm not taking words from any other trustee. Um, so the next point I'd like to make, um, in addition to thanking Dr. Goswami for uh, saying what he sees or how he interprets what he needs to do from the list of whereas's, um, I'm very pleased to hear what he had to say. Um, I would like us not to get um, hung up on um, semantics. And let's not typecast um, people. Um, because, and this issue keeps coming up is about, uh, this is the third time I've been confronted with it or not directly confronted with it, but um, been paying close attention to it for the past uh, 
few weeks, this idea that um, <clears throat> that uh, people being colorblind. Um, I think in a way um, some, that some people typecast people if they say they're colorblind or they don't see color. Maybe we need to be, when we explain things or what we mean, we need to be more explicit um, because it's easy to get hung up on semantics. For example, when most of the people I know say they're colorblind or they don't see color, it's not a literal statement. It's not like, I don't see that you're different from me. It's, I do see you're different from, different from me. And I do understand that. It's just not important to me. I don't care. What I care about is, can I work with you? Can, that we all are, are treated equally and we all have certain inalienable rights. Um, so there's a difference in understanding of those terms. So to create a subgroup out there of our population is a divisive thing when you haven't really defined what you mean by the term. Um, outside of that, I'm very pleased with this. I, I'm very pleased with the progress that Dr. Dr. Goswami's, uh, uh, the direction that he's going. And uh, I have no criticisms at all. I, I am really pleased that he, that he put the, uh, that he moved the emoji office. And I think that that's a really cool thing. I, and I, in fact, I have from the beginning. Um, so let's, uh, let's just proceed with this. This is not going to be easy because a lot, have, a lot of factors have changed um, in, within the last two years and especially since March. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. And I'll take my hand down if I can figure out how. There we go. Okay, Craig, thanks for your comments. Uh, Kate, you're, you're up next. Thank you. A couple of things. First, I wanted to say thank you to Trustee Nielsen because um, I, I had commented on that with some of the questions and emails that I got that I absolutely knew that uh, even with a divided uh, vote on that resolution that I were uh, a board that follows the policy and would um, would be uh, function as a whole when it came to implementing the resolution. Um, so I appreciate his comments on that. Um, I, I wanted to, t to address uh, what Dr. Goswami brought up around uh, board policies and looking at them through an equity and anti-racist lens. Um, I do think that's very difficult for a board to, and it's impossible for a board to do alone. Um, and I'll, I'll bring up the example of um, the very, uh, the, the ubiquitous system-wide um, equity barrier that was in place until recently. And that was the practice of each community college having its own plus placement exams um, for putting students into math and English. And they were so entrenched um, that it actually took state legislation to get the community college system to budge on that. And, um, and yet the voices that were loudest for fight, fighting AB 705 um, and that we're fighting that change despite looking at the data out there were the ones that I think would have said that they were fighting for equity and access, that they were trying to do the right thing for students. Um, and sometimes those can come in conflict. And um, so I think that as we move forward with looking at our policies, there may be groups on campus that already have identified some things that they think we should change in our policies. But there may be things there that nobody has recognized yet. And I just want to be sure that as we move forward, that it's incredibly, I mean, it is a collaborative process, but it really takes counselor involvement and it takes student involvement to be sure that we, um, that we don't miss things because we will miss things otherwise. Thank, thank you, Kate. I, I, I share in both of your comments. I, I, I also appreciate Craig's uh, comment that we we act as the board acts as a whole after making uh, decisions and I I share your your comments about uh, applying the uh, equity lens to uh, to board policies um, and I think AB 705 is a good example it, it's a difficult difficult process and so we're going to need a lot of help with uh, with that uh, with that commitment 
Um, Jonathan, you're next on the list. Thank you. Um, you know, it's only been a month since this resolution passed, and it's really nice to see that there's been a lot of progress made already. I, I just want to thank everybody who already presented today and shared their thoughts. Um, Akil and Carson and Cornelia, Liz, Rianne and Dr. Goswami, you know, really thank you for, and, and um, sorry, uh, we had a, we had another presenter, Jason. Um, thank you for making those comments. And uh, the I know it's a, it's a lot of extra work on top of the current work that exists, but thank you for making it a priority. Um, I think Kate made a great point uh, and in where like the decision makers might sometimes have a different point of view from the people on the ground. And we, we don't want that here. I think it needs to be something where the people on the ground, people most affected um, are leading us through it. And so for like the equity and anti-racist lens, you know, I think, you know, we, we, we have a good group that's majority people of color from all the different sectors of campus, like was mentioned, um, who sit down and, you know, they can effectively identify the issues in every policy, like analyze it, what are the real world implications? Um, how might this negatively affect uh, somebody from an equity and race lens? And then let's reword that and let's rework it to, to what uh, they think would be most effective. Um, and obviously we'd be involved, but again, we don't go here. We don't work here. Uh, we show up to a board meeting twice a month. We, there's no way for us to know um, how to make the policies anti-racist and equity driven, especially on a practical application, how they play out on a day-to-day. -day. So that would be my input there. I, I think we definitely, you know, we have a lot of expertise on campus and people who have lived experience, which is one of the most ex important. Um, so I think we, we need to prioritize them in leading it. I don't, I wouldn't be opposed to having some outside help, but it would, I think it would be outside help from within the community still, not flying someone in or you know, zooming someone in from another community I think we should we should keep this uh, local I think we have a lot of expertise here in the community and if we really don't we can look outside but I think you know campus first and you know, our district second and then beyond that um, in terms of helping us do this um, I, I really appreciate as well the uh, not going to be a one and done colloquium to would address these issues that was kind of the same direction we ended up going at the Isle of Us Community Services District. Let's not have one hearing on this. It's gonna be dozens and we're gonna talk about the different aspects of the issue. I think that's a great uh, approach. So I, I wanna thank you all for taking that. And it's, again, it's more work, but it I think it'll end up becoming very uh, valuable work. Um, and then I, I hear the, you know, it's been a while since we had the panel, the original six panelists present, but I know one of the first things that was mentioned in my notes was, you know, we're going to need to be ready to make an investment to make this happen. And I'm ready for that. Again, like I said earlier, when we have these performance rates, you know, it's the college is, is not performing the way it needs to. And we need to invest in ourselves to make our college a better place. And when we make it a better place for black students and Brown students, we make it a better place for everybody too. So I'm, I'm, I'm ready to make that investment. Um, and the one last two th last things is, you know, the key word that I really focused on and the second whereas that I just like to see, it was described a little bit how this will look, but just to see it more on paper is uh, focused institutional effort to identify and remove barriers. So to me, it's like, you know, mass mobilization, everybody's job on campus, our job, just you know, down to everybody's role to to do that, and then just lastly, you know, just want to again say it's important to center the black audiences who are affected the most and let them lead, and you know, we can be the support in this case. So thank you for having this. This was a great to hear from our constituent groups, and I'm looking forward to work with everybody on this. Thank you, uh, Jonathan, for all those uh, thoughtful comments. I, uh, I I share in your uh, in your focus. And um, thanks again to you and uh, Marcia for your efforts to uh, put this resolution together. It's really, it really is gratifying to see it begin to uh, um, take place actually. And uh, we're on the way, there's so much more to do. So thank you. And uh, Marcia, you're 
next on the list. Well, thank you, Robert. And, and thanks to everyone for your comments, because I, I really think they've all been very helpful. Um, I wanted to make a couple of comments about um, perhaps even expanding our our vision here. And, and I really appreciate also the progress. I should mention that because um, it's been said, but thank you to everyone and Dr. Goswami for moving forward quickly with this and making progress. Um, my thinking was a little bit like Kate's um, in terms of the review of the board policies and procedures as someone who's sat through three years of that to get all the way through all our board policies and procedures, it is a big job. Um, what you will likely find is that many of the board policies and procedures are tied to statutes or Title V. And so there may be a separate box here or a, a list where folks feel that the requirements in law the statutes or the Title V regulations are what need to be changed first because we can't contradict those. We can't overwrite those. So you may want to come to us with, with, hey, this is not right. And that kind of harkens back to Kate's example with AB 705 and the individual, the impact of individual colleges having their own um, placement assessments. Um, we may have a list to take to the legislature. Um, or the chancellor's office. In addition, um, I think our most important policy document is the budget. And I would suggest that where the money goes is what controls what happens at this institution. And this is something that this group may wanna look at in terms of policy. Um, and and I am not the only one who thinks this. this is a, a description that is in, you know, routinely uh, made by uh, the league and other places where they describe the things that trustees do and the things that colleges do. So it, it's not just my idea. Um, on the um, colloquium section, I do think um, Jonathan has a good point, but at the same time, I would be really excited to hear about some of the research that has been done and the example I have, for example, and, and I have no idea whether this is possible. But the example I have is that there is a very interesting work being done um, called the Opportunity Atlas. It relies on big data and it talks about the impacts of where you live to your future success down the road, um, your job, your income, when you're um, in your 30s, I believe, uh, was the, the time frame. And it's, a, it's done by a person of color. Um, it's uh, extremely detailed and it takes you right down to the community level. We can see in Santa Barbara those specific results, where you live, how it affects your your success. And I think that would be informative to us. Whether we could have that person come and talk would be a totally different question. He's a MacArthur winner, won a MacArthur Award for this work. And, um, but I think it would be fascinating to get that kind of perspective um, as well as other interesting research, uh, as well as all the things that we have that are local. I just think having the opportunity to broaden the perspective would be valuable for everyone. Thank you, Marsha. Um, I think that- That's it. I, I think uh, I, I, your last comment was important. I, I, since, uh, the whole Black Lives Matter uh, movement has has erupted in the in the past uh, couple months. I've done a lot of reading myself, and there are a, a lot of uh, primarily from African American writers. And uh, I, I gathered a lot of thoughts. I'm not going to go into them today, but I, I look forward to the I can never pronounce it correctly the uh, colloquium that we uh, that we can hear from people who are experts uh, and that can give us ideas that uh, we, we can utilize in 
proceeding with our uh, commitments and various action items and how we can affect change, I guess. And change often happens because we acquire new information. And so I look forward to uh, seeing the uh, colloquiums uh, occur. I forgot one item, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, and that is just that we do have a board policy 2410 about how we develop changes to board policies. And that itself may be one that people want to propose something like we need to subject these policies to an equity lens through this group as it becomes perhaps ongoing in our, in our college. Um, but it's also something that is useful for us to consider as we do this process, because that is the process. And not only do you look at existing board policies and, and administrative procedures, but you may say we need a new one that we don't have at all. And there's a process in there for doing that. Very good. Thank you for that suggestion. Veronica. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Dr. Gaswami, for... Uh, this has been a great morning so far. So I have an example of a couple of ways in which in the last um, eight years, we've looked at policies uh, with regard to equity. And so for example, uh, a few years ago, uh, Trustee Kugler, Marianne and I, we looked at the data with Dr. Gaskin and we looked at the data around um, the disproportionate impact that um, our classified staff um, would have if we if we were going to move forward with the decision to not allow them to teach. And so at the time, the data and I, Marianne looked like, we looked at the classified staff, which at that time had a higher percentage of um, folks of color teaching those classes compared to our faculty. And so when we sat down and sort of looked at everything, the decision was made, yeah, we do want our folks that are running Running Star in our transitions program and teaching some of our courses in our classified staff to be able to do that. So that was something, I think one example of where we were able to look at sort of a system at the college that had we made a decision to go one way, it would have had a disproportionate impact, a negative impact on our efforts to diversify our workforce. And at that point, it just so happened to be that we had a number of folks of color teaching um, that were classified staff that were teaching at the faculty. So that was one way that um, we were able to look at something at the college and, and address it. Another way that um, we were able to work on, again, with Dr. Gaskin, and this is probably a benefit because I teach in K-12, so I, I have access to hearing from a lot of the different families. And so a lot of our students that are also the parents or the um, family members are taking our ESL courses. There were systems with the way we were delivering our courses and whether it was like a registration thing or just a sheer um, hour of time we were offering the course. And so of course at the trustee level, these aren't things that we can get involved with, but the way I've seen these um, policies or systems be improved is by letting the superintendent know, hey, these are some observations in the community and again, with that issue with the ESL, Lori was able to quickly work with the department and identified, oh, that was just like a systemic barrier there that we didn't realize it was like a, a glitch in our system or something. There was something with registration in the way the instructor was getting to the class, but they were able to fix it within a matter of weeks. And that opened up the door to a number of families at the time we had a class here at Franklin. Um, Another uh, example is with our dual enrollment. Uh, you know, we've been revising that over time. And as that system improves, we're creating a bigger pipeline for more students to access the college. So for example, the more courses we get on the college campus means that students don't have to drive to the campus. So if students have access to a car or a parent to help them get to the campus in the evening, they do that but sometimes students that are living in multi-generational families or they just don't have access to um, be able to get to campus, they have to be home. So those are things that I think that have been improved over time and certainly there's more work. Um, and the last one, which I'm happy to hear about from, uh, is that the focus on K-12 partnerships. The Academy of Sciences put out their webinar a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things out to the practitioners in the field is, Unfortunately, with the recent um, pandemic that we've had, Black, Latinx, Indigenous students, those are the students that are going to have the biggest disproportionate impact on what's going on 
we close the schools. So young children who don't have the skills to regulate their own learning and adults that um, can't always help the children, we're gonna see a huge gap um, in K-3 learning. And we're, gonna, we're running the risk of, uh, of really just preventing access to, uh, to education specifically for low-income students. So I think that one thing that the college, um, even looking at our systems with the uh, Career Skills Institute, I know in the last semester, I sent out a lot of our um, short courses to parents and said, hey, you can take this computer course to learn more about Excel or Google or Microsoft. So I think that the college already has, as the different members of the college community mentioned, a lot of things that we're doing. And so to me, when I look at this stuff through an equity lens, it's sort of what you were saying, Dr. Deswami, is how is this having an impact for the student to complete the course to meet whatever goal they have for that semester? Um, and so I think that there's a, while there are a lot of systemic things at the state level, like Kate and uh, Marsha mentioned, there's a lot of systems within, sorry, there's construction outside, within our college that I think we can look at. And so I'd be happy to work with you, Dr. Gazwami, uh, and the college on that and, and to see if there are anything in our policies where we can improve that type of access. And that's sort of how I can think of it in the last eight years where we've addressed some of these things. As you said, they were a barrier. We removed the barrier, but now we help those students get through the door and actually complete what they had to complete. Um, and then the last would be working with local business. Uh, in the last couple of months, unfortunately, our communities have shut schools. And so that's disproportionately um, affecting students that already didn't have access to um, literacy, math, and then we've also shut down businesses. So for our local community, families have lost jobs and they've lost their schools all within a matter of five months. And so this idea that we can, um, you know, anything that the college can do, because this is the pipeline for all of our students and we're going to see the impacts of the last five months for the years to come and really I think in the decade to come because parents cannot help remediate what's been lost in the zero to eight world. Um, an area that we do well in is in the parent-child workshop. I think we already have a model there um, by which parents enroll in a course and then they you know, parallel work with the faculty to learn how to help their kids. Um, all great things that I think we already have. So as we dive in, I, I think that we can um, make a difference in this area. And, and I've certainly seen it. I've seen it with our past presidents in terms of identifying systems that we've had that um, can increase uh, equity and access for all our students. Thank you, Veronica, for your, uh, for your comments. Um, thank you for everybody's uh, comments. Dr. Gaswami, before we um, move on, do you have anything else you want to add or respond to that occurred to you as you were listening to the yeah oh uh, actually i would like to probably you know engage the board in, in a little bit more in-depth uh, conversation on some of these matters regarding you know structural inequities and things of that sort so maybe i'll provide certain prompts and see whether you know uh, you want to engage and respond to it no uh, so um the systems grow up always everywhere, not just in the United States, all over the world, throughout human history, to support the dominant class. Systems always grow up to support the dominant class. And the systems that are stable, that means they succeed in staying for a long period of time, are systems that have very successfully supported the cause of the dominant class. Because if they did not support the cause and, and the needs of the dominant class, that system would be changed. So, so, we, so when you talk about structural problems, it is, whether you call it a problem or, or what, but the fact of the matter is, in every society, structures will grow up and systems will grow up and stabilize around things that support the dominant class. Uh, and one of the ways that it ends up manifest, manifesting in, in, in society is 
systems allow for generational wealth to accumulate. And systems prevent generational wealth from accumulating. So that's one big issue because a lot of our structures are dependent on generational wealth. So when, when Marsha talked about that, no, your zip code will determine no, by the age of 30 where you'll be, whatever it is, you can ultimately pinpoint it down to some element of generational wealth in there. Uh, that is something we as, as, as an education institution cannot do much except educate people around it because it's way beyond our scope of sphere of influence. But however, we can recognize that even within ourselves, we have built systems that give advantage or depends on legacy. So a lot of our structures, a lot of our you know, things are very, very legacy dependent. And what I mean by legacy dependent is that our kids, by virtue of the fact that we are educated, by virtue of the fact that we have been to college, already have a leg up compared to other students because we have built systems all over the campus, not just here, but everywhere, where you expect that the person who is coming in, you expect that person to know something. And the only way they can know something is, is by being around people who, who knew about it. So that is something we need to look at carefully. That a lot of our things that we do as an education institution, you know, we are very, very legacy dependent. Our legacy knowledge department. So they, 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 we expect them to know something from somewhere. Uh, That I think causes a lot of students to kind of know, kind of fall off the rails. The other, you know, is learning. The whole notion of learning for the sake of learning is a very, very elit elitist proposition. Yes, no, you can make the argument that well, if you're really interested in learning, just you know, think about Aristotle, Homer, whoever. But a lot of people given from given where they come from, they don't have the luxury of that. For them, best way to connect is is through context. And then as you look at our curriculum, I mean, the curriculum is a paradigm in stability. Paul Simonson's Economics 1948, and, and you take the latest economics textbooks, not much different except for a few additional items that came up, you know, game theory and things of that sort. Again, those things have been developed, especially the examples that actually allow people to connect to, to the content. Again, grew up around the dominant you know, uh, group, around the dominant group's experience. So part of when you talk about changing the system and structure and culture, we need to start talking about what we teach in history and what are examples that we give. 
you know, for a long while in most universities, Western research was a you know, very, very you know, important component of you know, general education curriculum. But Western self left out a whole bunch of other things that could have been legitimately part of Western self. So, so those are some of the things as we explore the notion of you now through the equity lens in terms of some of our policies. Practices, we can talk, you know, it will come down from the policies to the practices later on. But no, from the policy perspective, I think, you know, I'm suggesting that that is one of the lens we should apply. That is there a alternative way of looking at this? Because the de facto, the way we write language, write clauses, write whatever, is always going to be a dominant class. And here I'm not, I'm not singling out African-American versus this or whatever it is, because it is, it, is, it is what it is. It is ultimately from the dominant paradigm. Because you, know, you, you go to Nigeria, uh, there will be multiple groups, but their structures will grow around the dominant group in Nigeria. You go to Egypt, same thing. So that is something, you know, what we are trying to accomplish is to make the playing field level. And, uh, and, and so, you know, so this second element I would suggest in terms of looking at policies and procedures would be, you know, what are we doing to level the playing field? I just wanted to react. No. Well, I have an initial uh, reaction, Dr. Goswami, because it makes me think about um, the economically disadvantaged students and how they have been affected by the movement to online instruction of the, due to COVID-19. And I think we've done some wonderful things in that area, being able to provide uh, uh, laptops, the Chromebooks to, to students. We, we actually, the foundation initially, and then the, the college itself from funds from the CARES Act, were able to actually make some, from some cash contributions to students in need. But beyond that, uh, I do wonder uh, how many students are suffering because they don't have, uh, either don't have a internet connection. I know that we provided some hotspots and I always wonder how well those really work. Um, but those, those who don't have the best equipment, the best connections, uh, the best situation at home because now they're at home uh, having to uh, go to college from home or wherever their home might be. So I, I I'm really very interested in knowing how this has in fact impacted students who are who are economically disadvantaged, and it's probably too early to know that. But I I, I want us to keep that in mind uh, uh, going uh, forward. My guess is it's been a tremendous impact on on a certain number of uh, certain number of students. Um, have some other people with comment, Jonathan? You got additional comment? Um, no, I, I just wanted to thank Dr. Goswami for his closing comments because I think it's just clear he's really thought long and hard about this and you know, I'm excited to work with him in solving these issues because that's, again, I think that's the point of our college. And then I was going to ask if we could take a short break before going into the next topic, which I think is another meaty one and is connect, you know, what you just said, the disparities in the, how we do education now. Are, is also another big issue. So, my plan is to take a ten minute uh, ten minute break as soon as we finish this uh, this topic. There are a couple other people who uh, have comments. Marsha, did, did you have another comment to make? Well, I appreciate Dr. Goswami's comments, um, and I would be actually interested in knowing. I mean, I think this is a long term project, and as you, Robert, and Veronica have mentioned. 
um, the virus will have uh, a impact on at least a distinct group of students. Hopefully we'll get past this time period and, but we will still be working on the equity um, and um, the inequity uh, that we see for many years, I think. And so we're at the beginning of a long project here, which has a piece of it that is affected by the virus. Um, so I'm interested in what Dr. Goswami is, is saying about how we might level that playing field. Um, what examples do you see um, that flow from this philosophical structure you've described? Do you, do you want to address that now, Dr. Goswami? Let, let, let all the board members speak. Or then I'm okay. Right. Peter, you have uh, your hand up. I do. I was intrigued by Dr. Goswami's uh, reference to um, a focus on curriculum. I, I remember the course that I took many, many years ago that focused on Western civilization, but it it, it focused uh, not just on Western, but it was much more narrow than that. And, and of course, you know, the ultimate decision of what to include in, in, a, in any particular course of study belongs to the faculty member providing that instruction. But that wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't set aside the possibility of providing guidance about the global nature of subject matter. I mean, we've tried it before on, on, uh, on campus and in, in an effort to globalize curriculum one way or another, uh, because there are, there, there, there are prevailing thoughts that you know, everything worthy was, must have been developed in the United States. And maybe it wasn't. Uh, if we could wake him up, Pythagoras would probably be stunned to think that we thought that the Pythagorean theory was was invented here. But I think influence can be can be uh, shared, and through our uh, through our uh, annual in-service programs, and I think uh, I think the faculty will embrace the effort that you're suggesting. When I took Western civilization, uh, Peter, the I note that it conveniently ended before we ever got to the topic of slavery. <laughs> yes. The whole, the whole concept of Western civilization, I think in teaching was to teach students how great Western civilization was, but they left off one of the most, the darkest moments in Western civilization. That is, I think, slavery. Uh, Veronica, do you have a comment? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Goswami. I, you know, one thing that came up to mind when you talked about leveling the playing field, and and I think that our campus, actually, I know our campus has already started doing this. And you know, you said you don't know how to do something unless someone's either taught you. And so, by sheer legacy, I was a first-generation college student. Uh, my parents, you know, worked in a hotel, worked in um, uh, a greenskeeper. We all went to college and, and, and now we're here. And so my kids are having a different experience because there's some familiarity to the systems of higher education and the way we do school. So what I've seen, and not just from my own kids, but from uh, members around the community specifically, in a time where you would think this is, it is challenging because you're doing online. I've seen um, the, the way that our faculty are structuring the syllabus and, and looking at how um, these students are, even the way I did online classes, you know, through Fullerton, which and Fullerton did an amazing job with their pedagogy for online learning. I'm seeing a lot of intentional teaching. I've received a lot of comments and I know I emailed Rayanne. Uh, the families are, um, they're seeing such a drastic difference in the way, ironically, their students are learning to become better students because of the way the syllabus is being laid out, because it is um, so explicitly organized. So maybe a child or student, uh, college student that didn't, you know, wasn't as organized in their high school uh, experience, 
because the layout of the course on campus is so clean and compact, it's actually allowing the student to succeed at a better rate than if they were just given a lecture and then some papers to go fumble through. So that's just one example that I think that um, I'd like to hear more and learn about how we can level the playing field with regard to what's happening in the classroom and as students progress from course to course. Um, and that's really, I have um, all to add to that. Um, I, I think that that is one of the biggest things that we have to overcome, like I said, is how do you know what you don't know if someone doesn't help you? I know as a, a, a teacher, when a parent is telling me, oh, they're registering for class, well, I can help them, you know, or I can help a neighbor or I can help a sibling or a cousin. Um, but if you don't know, you just don't know. And I think that that's the, the part where we keep even a community college like Santa Barbara City College that's supposed to have 100% access, access and equity to everybody, we keep, uh, you know, these things out because we just, people don't know how to get in there. I mean, Jonathan and I, we, you know, a couple of us, we've joked about the registration. It's like, how many people does it take to register a class? And I know Kate, we've had that same email with, how do you get this dual enrollment enrolled here? Um, so that, um, that, that we, now we know how to do it and we'll be able to do it. But upon the first time here, call it, you know, Kate went to college, I went to college and we're like, how do we do this? So imagine now other folks that haven't done it. So you bring up a really uh, valid uh, way of looking at this and I appreciate it and, and I, I support that. Thank you. So back back to you, Dr. Goswami. You have any oh. ending words oh. for comments for us? I think, you know, the, <clears throat> this is going to be a, long journey, um, you, you cannot undo years and years of things that have built up in a very short period of time. Uh, but as I have mentioned many times before, you know, even if you're not able to undo all the wrongs of the past, we can still create a welcoming environment And, and the key to creating a welcoming environment is when people come to this environment, they know that others are looking out for their interests. You feel safe in a place where you know that others are looking out for you, that you are not the only one who have to look out for yourself. So, so I think, you know, I see a lot of commitment among our faculty staff and students uh, to, to do something really good. Not just one thing, but lots of things. Um, so we just have to you know, match passion with skills. So, so we need to identify people with passion and people, we need to identify people who have certain skills and match the skills with the passion so that you know, those things can happen. Um, there's a bigger social issues. There are bigger social issues at play um, in terms of historical time. 1965 is just a few years back. All over the world, people are complaining about things that has happened in 1230 and, and, and 1440 and, and 1675. So the collective memory is very, very long. In the Middle East, they're fighting about things that happened way back in the, in the year 1000 or 1200, you know. So from, for, the US as a country, we have come a long, a long way, given that 1965 was just 50 years back. So we need to be impatient, but we have to be impatient with, with reason that some things will take time. And, and like Kate mentioned that a lot of the things regarding the curriculum and things like that, that has to be a you know, system-wide initiative because we cannot independently change what we do in history because our, 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 our 
transferability of the course will be jeopardized. So that's how systems lock things into place. And to unlock it, you have to kind of you know, have a systemic approach also. So I look forward to, you know, as you can see, I'm not afraid to tackle, you know, issues and, and speak my mind on, on those issues. And our, our campus community is also, you know, fairly, you know, you know, they want to speak their mind. And that's a good thing. We can probably channel it to productive ends and, uh, and make good things happen. So your, your resolution 18 was probably a good, good uh, uh, you know, impetus to jumpstart the process. You know, Dr. Gaswami, when you say making students, uh, students we have here more welcome, when if we do the right thing in, in all these commitments we've made, uh, if we do a lot of right things, students will feel more welcome. And when students feel more welcome, we'll have more of them <laughs> because the word will get out and there'll be more black and African students who wanna come here. So I, I think it'll, it, it'll end up uh, uh, generating uh, enrollment for the right, uh, right reasons. So now I see we have yet other comments. We're gonna to go to break here, but uh, Marcia, did you have a comment to make? Um, yes, I wanted to, uh plant the idea for people to think about that um, one of the systems that we have that we should look at is our program for international students. Um, it concerns me that we spend most of our time talking about them as if they were dollar signs um, and not students. And it also concerns me that our system is basically set up to recruit um, students who are in a position, who are in an advantaged position. Um, and that is, I think, as Dr. Goswami has just illustrated, um, results in a tier of success at the college where advantaged students who are admitted on the basis of a certain GPA, um, and that's true, I think, of out of state as well, and also on the basis that they can somehow afford to come to a very expensive place to live that is across the world if you're international, across the US if you're not. Um, so we're selecting the privileged students and they are doing by and large better than our other students. So our gap, if you wanna look at it, is between international student success and California student success, and then various ethnic groups success. Um, I think a system whereby we sought to recruit disadvantaged international students, students who given the opportunity could do terrific things with an education, um, whether they choose to return to their country or whether they choose to stay with us. Um, in either case, they start from disadvantage, not from advantage. And they are not recruited by organizations that make money off of recruiting students for colleges in the US. Uh, instead, we look for them because of their potential in a huge diversity. Diversity is another issue with this program. We have very little actual diversity. We have, at least historically, it's been mostly China and Scandinavia. Um, and the diversity in between is, is minor. MIT has a program whereby they have taken some of their uh, MOOCs, the large online classes, and they have students who have done spectacularly well on those, some of those difficult classes, but they come from a disadvantaged background. They come from a diverse set of international, you know, maybe they came out of Pakistan or Africa or countries that really don't have the opportunities that we might be able to offer. MIT finds those students and brings them to campus. And they say, you know, you really have a tremendous 
um, talent here, and we want to help you be able to move forward with that by, by bringing you to campus. And that involves a financial component as well, because you're basically taking students who can't afford to come here. And maybe you're using some of the money from your international student revenue, which is unrestricted, and using it to support bringing students who are disadvantaged, or you are using it for some of our equity initiatives that speak to um, students here in California. Uh, historically, the college didn't use the international student revenue to live off of. We didn't use it for operational things. We used it for special projects. And then we moved it at some point um, to living off of it. I think we should go back. I think we should make that special project money that then helps us with these initiatives that we want to have to level the playing field. So I'm throwing that out um, as an idea that would improve equity and diversity in a specific program. Thank you, Marcia. Interesting ideas. Um, Craig, do you have a comment? I don't see Craig. What? Sorry, I had to unmute. I forgot to, that I muted it. Um, yeah, I had something to share. Um, and I, I think it's, I think it's uh, appropriate um, to, I love what, I really, I really like what Dr. Goswami's his statements, what he said. Um, so I have a very, very two or three sentence uh, story to tell you. And, and it's kind of, a, it's about um, concentrating on what we've already done and not forgetting that. And as we move forward and add new things or want to enhance cer certain areas, we in many cases can go back and capitalize on what we've already done and should, history should not be forgotten. Um, was the old saying, lest we repeat the mistake, the past mistakes. But that isn't my point, is that I, um, I had my own business when I was, uh, you know, in my late 20s. And I was uh, in a community here in California where um, uh, as a business owner, I have people I did business with. And one day, a few of them, uh, came to me together and asked me to come to the Elks Club. And I told them, I can't do that. And they said, why? And I said, well, you know, my father-in-law is Latino. And once upon a time, um, he was interested in joining the Elks Club and um, was even proposed, but he was not allowed to join simply because of racial issues. So before you think I'm just complaining about this, I told, I told these gentlemen, these businessmen that I dealt with uh, almost daily that also own businesses, um, this, and they said, yeah, we know. And there's other issues too. Our wives um, are treated separately, but equally. They're not Elks. And they said, but if we could get enough people like you involved, we can change it. And you know what? It got changed. I'm not saying I changed it, but it changed. It changed a lot. Somebody, it used to be I could go into an Elks Lodge and you'd never see a minority face. Now you walk into an Elks Lodge and you see just about any lodge I've been to recently, which is maybe the last oh, three, four different ones, especially over just the last couple of years. Um, and you see all different colors of faces, different people. And my wife is actually a member of the Elks and I'm not currently. Interesting. Now women can be members, things change. And oftentimes we don't realize it or see that the change has happened and we still act like it hasn't changed. 
it and it does take time for the population to realize. So now we can relate that to a lot of things and not quit pontificating. But you could relate it to the progress of our promise program. And in I have I I deal a little bit um, on a weekly basis or better with the Latino business community here in Santa Barbara. And you know, the, the awareness of the Promise program has become very widespread. Where before, oh, I know about it, but I don't really know about it. And so it's changed a lot. And then there's some ramifications I'd like on us on the edge, on the fringe of that topic that I would like to share at a later time. But I, I really think to capitalize on what we've already done, not forget the history. And if you don't know the history, you know, look it up. But you could put too much emphasis on the fact that that we're still largely like a racist and a slavery in, and we're back in the slaveholding days. Or you can go past that and go, we still have problems, but it's getting better. Now, now, now what we're dealing with in these days is how to really make it better, how to refine that. that. Um, that's it. I'm done. Otherwise, I'm just wasting time and I want to take a break like everybody else. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Peter, do you have additional comments? I wanted to support uh, Dr. Goswami's notion that this is not going to happen overnight. It will take patience, and it's the issue of patience that I want to address. People will be patient so long as we make progress, so long as we do the earnest work that is going to be required, one step at a time. Patience will expire when we stop making progress. And Veronica, do you, thank you, Peter. Veronica, do you have another comment before we go to break? No, I apologize. I didn't lower it. Okay. So I've had suggestions uh, that we, uh, instead of 10 minutes, we do 15 minutes. I've had a suggestion that we do uh, 30 minutes. Um, we are going to finish at one o'clock. So keep that in mind. Um, I would, you know, and, and the suggestions came because some people might want to get a bite to eat before we go back. So I'm going to say 20 minutes, and uh, which would put us at a couple minutes past uh, noon. And then when we come back, we can tackle the uh, fall 2020 planning, the board's self-evaluation, and then there are a couple other items dealing with uh, board and CE roles and code of ethics. If, if uh, things go too long, we might uh, save some of those items for our next uh, half day. Uh, uh, Robert, it's a little longer than a couple minutes past noon if it's 20 minutes. It'll be 12.15. <laughs> yeah. Let's make it 12.15. Well, my watch apparently uh, stopped. What time, yeah. or what, what time do we have right now? 11.56. Ah, okay, well, that's my problem. Okay, 11.15 then. 12.15. 12. 12. We may have to go past one o'clock. <laughs> well, we, we're not going to, so uh, that's that's what I'm saying. Let's let's start at twelve fifteen, and we'll we'll work through. We may have to put some of the agenda items off, All right. but uh, we can talk about that. Okay. All right. Thank you.
So I got my, can people hear me? Yeah, I yeah. hear you. Okay, so I got my watch working. <laughs> it's, I see it's 1215. Do we have everybody uh, back with us? I see Marcia. Yes. Um, so before we start, uh, this uh, meeting is a little different. The, the agenda is a little different than others in that we set an end time. We, well, we said nine to one. Um, we're gonna, it's gonna be difficult, I think, to finish by one, but uh, people may have made plans based on the nine to one. Uh, we, I guess my suggestion is that we can go to one thirty, but I think not any later than that. Does anybody have a problem with that? Okay, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, I, I just have work um, that I scheduled. I think starting at one thirty, hoping that there'd be like a thirty-minute break. But I think our break was enough, so I can go a little past one. But I've got an appointment at one thirty. Okay, why don't we, we'll try to finish at 1.15, would that work? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, okay. Um, so our next item is 4.3 update on fall uh, 2020 planning. And we have a, a comment from Sally Sanger. Is uh, Sally uh, with us? I'm here. Are you able to hear me? Oh, Sally. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Um, let me see here. Well, I was going to start with good morning, but um, apparently things have changed. Uh, just, just so, just. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, good morning or good afternoon to the board members and to Dr. Goswami. Thank you for hearing my comments today. My name is Sally Sanger, and I'm a part-time faculty member at both the credit and non-credit since 1982. I have two parts to my address to you today, one of them being very brief. And the first one is more from the credit point of view, and the second one is from the non-credit point of view. Um, I participated in the Faculty Association Discussion Forum last week, which focused mostly on the uncertainty of the upcoming fall, fall term and whether we would offer in-person classes. It was really enlightening for me to hear the different perspectives from my colleagues and how varied their viewpoints were. Some faculty would like an earlier decision on whether we'll be offering in-person classes because they can provide, excuse me, there's my phone, sorry about that. <laughs> um, some faculty would like an earlier decision on whether we will be offering in-person classes because they can provide more definitive guidance to students at an earlier date. And other faculty are more comfortable with uncertainty if it means we can still offer classes in person. So um, a large portion of the discussion revolved around the viability of holding outdoor classes and or classes outside. So the consensus seemed to be that if the city allows summer camps, restaurants and hair salons to conduct business outside, why can't we educate our adult students outdoors in a controlled setting? There are a number of departments on campus who would suffer tremendously if their outdoor classes had to be eliminated. First and foremost is the area I work in, which is PE and athletics, which already has a robust outdoor offerings with excellent protocols in place to keep students and faculty stay safe and minimize risk. Physical activity classes are even more important nowadays, I'm sure you know, to help keep our students emotionally and physically healthy. And by the way, after listening to the morning uh, board meeting, PE and athletics are a draw and an attraction for many African-American and Hispanic students to, to attend SBCC. We serve a high percentage of these students in our department and I would hate to see them disenfranchised even more so by limiting their participation opportunities. But there are other departments like automotive, theater arts and art uh, and others that'll be deeply effective, if affected if our in-person outdoor classes are canceled. In fact, the theater arts department has a pretty cool um, outdoor fitness concept that's both imaginative and resourceful. Santa Barbara City College faculty of the affected departments are ready to reach out to legislators and county health authorities to lobby for our students and our programs. 
we're embarking on a phone and email campaign to impress upon decision makers that many community college courses can be held outdoors while minimizing risk and mass maximizing health and safety protocols. Santa Barbara, as you know, is blessed with good weather and an abundance of outdoor space. The college has passionate and creative thinking faculty who want to teach in the most important appropriate environment possible. For many, that environment needs to be in person. The combination of good weather, plenty of outdoor space and passionate creative teachers is an antidote for some of the obstacles that we've been facing as educators during the pandemic. Our local representatives have always been supportive of the SBCC and we anticipate that they'll be responsive to our request to hold classes safely outdoors it's incumbent upon us as a college to take advantage of all the opportunities available to serve our students. And I hope we can have the support of the, of the board as well. Last, my non-credit colleagues and I continue to hear from students daily about their frustration and even anger regarding the application and registration process for non-credit education. If you would like to be the recipient of profuse gratitude from non-credit students, staff, and faculty, then please apply whatever influence you have to expedite changes in the non-credit registration system so that it is student-friendly, inclusive, and accessible to our diverse student population as soon as possible. We would be forever grateful to you. Thank you for your attention today and for your service to the college. Thank you, Sally, for your uh, comments. And uh, we appreciate you waiting uh, <laughs> till we got to it this afternoon. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Gazwami, um, I think the, uh, our, our approach on this topic, we, we need to hear from you and what your thoughts are and plans for uh, the fall. I know this is a, a moving target um, I know you've been in touch with the uh, local health department um, and been uh, interacting with uh, uh, faculty on, uh, on campus, faculty and staff. So uh, I'll turn it over to you to let us know your, your uh, thoughts and uh, plans at the moment. Sure. Um, so if you recall, our, our plan for fall was that we will offer some courses, limited number of courses face-to-face -face, and majority of our courses online. Um, and then over the last few weeks, um, of course, it was always conditional upon the fact that we will, we will be allowed to teach online because if the county didn't allow us to teach online, then obviously there is no way we can teach online. Uh, that means that the Santa Barbara County will have to go to, I guess, stage four in the reopening scheme of things. Uh, right now, the county is in stage three. And we also know that starting June 6th, the county has been failing on two of the metrics of the, of the uh, uh, six metrics. And every once in a while, they, they fail on the third one also. So, um, so now, given that we are just about four weeks away from start of class, um, I kind of put in my you know, statistical or, or economist hat to figure out, is there any possibility that things might improve where the counting can get to stage four? So I did some numbers based on what we have seen in terms of let me point out the, the statistic or the criteria that's the most problematic, and that being the positivity rate. Uh, the county has been uh, above the positivity rate since June 6th, and, and it's hovering around 10.9, 11%, 10.8%, that range over the last, couple, last few days. So as I look at uh, the... <clears throat> the number of tests on the operator that is conducted per week and the historical data in terms of you know, what kind of positivity rate we see. My calculations show that we need 30% or more improvement of the daily uh, positivity rates 
on a consistent basis for a number of weeks. And I shared that information with the, our liaison from the public health department this Friday to see whether I was in the ballpark in terms of you know, in my analysis. And, and she agreed that you know, my numbers were pretty much right on. Um, so therefore, the conclusion I can draw is that the, even in the best case scenario, if everything works the way it's supposed to work, county might get to stage four, maybe early September, not before. And here are some things that are likely to cause the best case scenario not to happen. And one of the things that is a driver for the positivity rate is that it is the availability of tests. Right now, because of the lack of availability or constraints in the tests that can be conducted, the people who end up taking the tests are people who are at the at-risk group. So the general population does not get to take the test. If you have, if you have reason to suspect that maybe I, I need to check my uh, you know, whether I'm positive, you can't. So you have to give a reason as to why you need to be checked and you must fall into the high risk category to be able to check. Which means our positivity rate is unlikely to improve because positivity rate is going to improve with two things. One is there are more significant proportion of the population who are not sick also gets tested. And, and number two, when the endemic pop disease is declining. And uh, so there is no way I can see the best case scenario ha happening, which means that when August 24th comes, that we will not be in stage four. Now miracles can happen, but it's unlikely. It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen for a number of weeks after that also. So therefore, it is pretty much clear at this point that we will have to start the fall online. We'll have to start the courses in the fall online. Um, number two, the governor's executive order uh, allows for some exemptions for so-called, uh, what do they call it? They call it the essential workforce programs. And, and they, we have received uh, you know, uh, reconfirmation from the chancellor's office uh, that those programs are to continue. Uh, so those are programs like nursing, uh, radiology, uh, ECE, marine diving technology. So most of the career technical programs were uh, working with equipment or working in the lab is essential to complete the program. So those programs are supposed to continue. So what we will do is we'll look for options uh, in a safe way as to how some of those programs will you know, meet in class, not frequently, but only for the lab component of those things. Uh, some of those programs will start meeting maybe early, uh, as soon as classes start. And some programs will not need to meet in person until middle of October or, or, or early November. So, so my plan is that going forward, since it's now it's virtually an impossibility that we'll go to stage four, that we will stay uh, online, except for the programs that are exempted by the governor's executive order. And even for those programs, uh, we will have to get certification or attestation plus certification from the county regarding individual plans for each of those programs as to how they're going to maintain safety and distance and all of those things. Uh, and then we'll start the program. Uh, you heard Sally talk about uh, uh, outdoor uh, programs. 
Right now, there is no guidance from the state regarding how, what to do with outdoor programs. So I don't know how far it's going to go. So we'll have to go and see, we have to see how what transpires in the next three or four weeks. Uh, clearly, um, once we start online, there'll be a time by which it doesn't make sense to make any switch. So, so in my mind, if we do not get any green light to do some of the other classes, like biology lab, chemistry lab, things of that sort, uh, physically, by end of September, then pretty much the entire semester will be online because it doesn't make sense to make a switch for two or three weeks later on in the end of the semester. So, so right now, that's where we stand, that we, we, we are going to start the semester uh, online, except for the courses that are exempted or programs that are exempted by the governor's executive order. And even those programs will have to get you know, certification from the county. Uh, thankfully, those programs are very not large number of students. So you know, some of those programs are pretty small. Uh, so we can you know, uh, make sure that the uh, public safety is, uh, is maintained. Uh, this is something, a topic that has given most of the CEOs sleepless nights, as you know, uh, how to manage. Because unlike K-12, where you know, if you decide one thing, everything happens the same way. Here, not everything happens the same way because there are lots of you know, nuances in terms of how courses take place and, and what is required. And, and when we say face-to-face -face instruction, sometimes face-to-face -face instruction is not for the entire semester. It's for only, only for a short period of time. So, uh, so that's where you know, we have landed. Uh, I mean, I, I appreciate our faculty and staff. You know, some would have liked to have this decision much earlier, and others would have would have liked to for me to wait as long as possible to see if there any chance we can get to face to face classes. And right now, we have determined that you no, know, there is no way we can do face to face classes this fall. Uh, so we will start online except for the courses that are exempted because of you know, uh, the governor's uh, exemption order. And even those courses, not all of them will take place in, on campus. For example, some of the nursing and radiology students and things like that, they'll actually be in clinical settings. They'll occasionally come to campus for, for simulation labs and things like that. But most of the time they will be you know, in various hospitals one or two at a time. So Dr. Goswami, when, when you last talked to us about this subject um, uh, last month, I believe it was, and before, we were hearing uh, about the possibility of maybe 10% of the uh, sections that would be uh, uh, in-person in instruction. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear, what I understand what you're saying now is only a handful of classes will fall under this exemption and be able to have some yes. limited number of uh, classroom instruction. And it sounds to me like we're really only talking about a percent or two. Uh, it's not 10%. Yeah, it's, not, it's no longer 10%, no. Yeah. No. So it, it, this will be you know, probably, uh, I don't have a list with me, but no, I, it's only about eight or nine disciplines. And, and uh, you know, maybe one or two, or three classes each, so maybe 25 sections out of 1,500 or 2,000, 1,600 questions, no, sections. And as, and as we see here today, you're, you're not even certain those can happen. It's, it depends on uh, whether exemptions are, are possible. So, well, whether, whether the county you know, signs off on our, on our safety plan. They, the, county would have sent, the county health department would have the final say on this. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Jonathan, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, uh, just some questions and comments. So I, I want to thank you for sending this to us. Uh, good, really good now to have that in writing so that there's just more confidence with everybody. I, I think it's just better to know now what's going on. You know, what, one thing I've heard from Santa Barbara Unified School District members say, and you know, other people, but I heard it at their meeting 
um, was that let's just make an early decision, forget about in person and plan for the best online possible. Because a lot of people's time is going into planning for things that might not materialize when we could put our effort into something that will, you know, high chance of materializing and uh, can be just done really well. You know, there's a lot of examples of how we can just make online with some sort of, you know, better support. But um, let's just say we're going to do that and forget about in person this semester, because as we saw, when things opened up just a little bit and people got irresponsible, uh, we went right back into a terrible situation. And my, my personal position, again, is to not, not, you know, as very little as possible in-person interaction by people affiliated with Santa Barbara City College in any way. So, you know, I, I like what I was hearing being described with even the classes that are quote unquote face-to-face, -face, it's still, you know, very socially distant and not that many people and only once or something like that because it would be blood on our hands if our school was a vector for the virus. And I just read that in other colleges and university towns, the classes are being a vector for the students getting infected at class and then spreading it to their multifamily living situations, which are usually lower income, black and brown. They're spreading it to when they go to the grocery stores to at-risk populations there. So someone getting it at Santa Barbara City College which a lot of people would come here and then going back into the community. I don't want that on our hands. And just because the city and the county want to open up restaurants for outdoor dining, that's not a good idea. If Why should we be following them? We should be doing what's best that we think are going beyond the minimum. So even when we do those certifications, I know maybe it's, it's not something we're going to be uh, deciding exactly how that looks, but I think they'll still come out to the board at least to have a public eye to them to show that we're being responsible if we are going to apply for something to be in person there's clear reasons and clear procedures and process for making it safe just so that you know i want to be comfortable that you know we're and i'm sure the public would like to see us being uh, very responsible if we were going to apply for an exemption so as and let's like minimize that as much as possible and again early decision Let's just forget about in person for the rest of the semester. Like, I mean, like Dr. Goswami kind of acknowledged already, um, it might, you know, the time where it might be okay to go in person, I, I doubt it might be too late anyways. Um, and I know a lot of colleges have even taken the smaller step of saying after Thanksgiving, it's gonna be only online for sure because people might mix on the holiday. At that point, if we're talking about after Thanksgiving being online, and then what's, what's the use of a month of putting all that energy trying to make it work when it's still not going to be normal? It's going to still be a lot of effort to make it work in a modified way. Let's just do a really good job with what has worked to a degree and can be really improved if we focus on the very you know, specific issues that we're experiencing. That's my input. Thank you, Jonathan. Kate? Yes, thank you. A couple of questions and comments. Um, first of all, Dr. Goswami, um, uh, there are a lot of things that that um, that you can go forward with with county public health. But I know that both you know residential co uh, colleges across the state, but also still for us, we are looking for guidance on specific things like PE, for example. Um, has there been any word either from the chancellor's office or from the governor's office as to when the state is going to update their higher education guidelines? None whatsoever. We have been left to swim by ourselves. That is very frustrating. Um, and I'm and I'm sorry. I hope it comes. I hope it comes soon. I know that um, uh, a lot of our local uh, institutions are, you know, kind of hands up and moving forward with some assumptions that may or may not end up coming true. Um, and then just a comment on like your, 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 your aside about, uh, so, you know, we'd already, you'd already made the decision that 90% uh, of the uh, courses were going to be completely online for the fall semester. So we're really just talking about the eight or 9% that are between th these essential courses and, yep. and the ones you'd hoped. 
Um, and what I would say is that um, the reality is, is that students um, make choices about online classes. You know, they may choose to go into sections at the start of the, uh, of the year. Um, for the most part, SVCC teaches uh, online asyn asynchronously. Um, and so if you make a switch, if you were to try to make a switch in October, um, then commuter students or um, you know, students who have other kinds of conflict for those particular times may not be able to continue with those classes. And so I agree with Jonathan that it's probably best to um, make, for, make the call for, um, uh, for it to be just online if it's gonna be online for the semester. And, and I'll, I'll keep my fingers crossed that the governor's uh, guidance comes out soon and that there can be some changes for things like PE, for example. Um, and those are my two cents. Thank you, Kate. Veronica, do uh, you have a comment or question? Thank you, Robert. Dr. Goswami, with uh, e uh, the ECEs, well, that means that uh, Orphala will be opening up? Mm, that's too much in the weeds in terms of exactly what we might do. So, okay. so we are talking yeah. about the instruction part. Okay. Uh, I think the uh, child care some is already exempted some part of child care. So that's all I know, but I cannot give you exactly in terms of law what might happen. Yeah, okay. And then I'm wondering, the business community was able to pull out the prison numbers from Lompoc out of the county numbers. And that's how the business community was able to open up, which locally, it, it's a great thing. I know I have personally been eating out twice a week because I'm seeing all my parents or families. I mean, a large percentage of the leisure and hospitality industry in Santa Barbara is our Hispanic Latino students and so a family's parents and so I know when I went to Janine's about a month ago you know the fa families were like oh thank you for coming thank you for supporting so it's a it's a tricky uh, thing to balance here but I do think that that is definitely helping with the economic well-being of of folks that the business community was able to do that one of the things that the Academy of Sciences uh, pointed out was that this should be a local decision um, and that we have to weigh in the long-term educational risks of not learning and also the mental and emotional um, impact of in-person versus um, not in-person. Um, and so, and this was more, it was looking at K-12 and looking at the youngest kids, bringing them back first was a recommendation and all the way up to high school. But one thing that the science, community they highlighted is that there's still there's urgent need for research on this they said they just they don't know what the role of airborne transmissions are because of COVID and there's a need for urgent research on the effectiveness of all these different mitigation strategies so I guess I say that in empathizing with you and your role as you're making all these decisions and I certainly appreciate all the number crunching uh, that you did so I'm supportive of of whatever you need to do but I do um I I do think that if we can offer classes outdoors, I'm in full support of doing that. I know with the youngest students, I am terribly concerned with the fact that we've shut schools for families that need it and we've taken their jobs and we're just, I don't know how we're gonna recover from that for years. And so if, and then the mental health well-being of being locked up at home and if you can get out in a field or a P class or ceramics, Whatever we can do in that area, I guess to our speaker's comments, I, I do want to support us looking at whatever we can, putting a pla plan in place with mitigation strategies that the county would approve that can get folks outdoors if possible. Um, because it's true, the kids, the families are out at camps, the zoo's open, junior lifeguards is open, the restaurants are open. Um, so people are definitely out and about um, with the mitigation efforts they put in place. So anyway, um, uh, I support your thinking along the way, but I also support if there's a need and to be able to do um, some outdoor stuff, you know, within reason, that'll be good. Thank you. Hey, Veronica. Marsha, do you uh, have some comments, questions? Um, yes, um, I agree with Jonathan. Um, I am concerned, I mean, 
I think we're all having sleepless nights over this one. Um, I know I am. And um, Veronica just mentioned about people being out and about um, and the economic impacts. See, these, are, these are horrible things, the economic impact, but we're talking about a virus here that does not care. And I listened to the comments for the um, K-12 Santa Barbara Unified um, meeting. And a couple of them struck me as very to the point. Um, one was that online is temporary, death is permanent. And the other was that when the board is meeting in person, maybe then they should be talking about classes meeting in person. Um, I think those were pretty good comments. My concern is at this point, um, since we seem to be planning to be online for starters, that the board has not seen the plan. Um, and a plan that meets the minimum requirements may not be comfortable. Um, people out and about now are part of the reason that we are not doing well as a country and locally. Um, we're not doing a good enough job in stopping this virus. So I think we have to be very careful about our part in that. Uh, as Jonathan said, there are other schools having bad experiences. The uh, uh, Marlins just canceled their opening game. And we know that the sports teams like that have had extraordinary plans to prevent transmission, but they're getting it anyway. So my concern here is that our plan needs to be something that the board sees, the whole college sees, that we all feel comfortable with. And I will say upfront that a plan that doesn't include testing, testing before you start a face-to-face -face class, testing periodically while you're doing a face-to-face -face class is very uncomfortable for me. And the reason for that is that um, a, the science shows that a substantial portion of the transmission of this disease is from people who are asymptomatic. Either they never recognize that they had symptoms because they're mild or unusual, or they are a few days before getting their symptoms. And that is a highly infectious period. So relying on um, do you have symptoms? Do you have the temperature? Doesn't do it. That is back from February when we were hoping that would be enough. Um, and I am not comfortable with that kind of a minimum. I think if we have a small handful of classes and we can implement testing, maybe we get there. But if we have, if we can't implement testing, I think we are flying blind, basically. And we have to be realistic that people interact when they're out there, even outside, they interact together. They, there are some people who don't want to wear masks and you have to deal with that. Um, there are some people who will forget social distancing. We all are used to something closer and you will forget it. Um, so these things happen. And as a result of that, our community is, is still uh, slowly we hope, climbing out of, of, of a not good place. Uh, and the whole country is in a not good place as compared to other developed countries. We are uniquely poor in our response to this virus. Well, Marcia, thank you for your comments. I, I share your concerns. Uh, be, before I uh, ask uh, Veronica to comment, I, I guess I'd like to ask Dr. Goswami um, to respond to the uh, concerns that Marsha raised about uh, testing of those classes that we might uh, do um, in person. Um, this is something our, our um, some of our work, not some, our task force that looked into openings and considered <coughs> and, uh, and determined that given that uh, A, testing is not available, the B, that it takes anywhere from 10, 12, 14 days for, for, for results to come 
come through in many cases. Uh, that is, it, it, it's not going to help anything. So, so we have determined not to, you know, go down the testing route. But at some point in time, if it so happens that anybody can go get tested, you know, at a moment's notice, and uh, and and results can be obtained within a day or two. Uh, that's then, of course, we will definitely uh, implement testing. But given that right now it's you know it's a it's a backlog, plus it's not available. It's it's not a feasible strategy. But I understand now that that if we can do that, that'll be much better. Okay, Peter and Veronica and Marsha all have additional comments. We haven't heard, heard from Peter yet on this. Peter, what do you have something to? Uh, I just add? to clarify my understanding and my understanding from the current discussion. Uh, and presentation by Dr. Goswami is that we, we're going to take safety first. That's right. That uh, the, and, and until we have an adequate process for testing, we're, we're just not going to take those kinds of chances. No, I, I, I didn't say that, that our thing depends on testing. No, we have, we have, we are not, including testing as part of our plan at this point in time, because it's not available. Peter, you're talking about the county testing or the, county, the testing that's available to the public, not outside of uh, SBCC. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, I, I just want to, I mean, I support Marsha and Jonathan's position completely that safety is first. Uh, if, if we can accommodate outdoor education such as presented I thought very well by by Sally Sanger I, I think we should do that so long as it can be accomplished uh, sensibly and with safety Veronica did you have a additional comment yeah, no, I just wanted to follow up, you know, both Jonathan and Marsha mentioned Santa Barbara Unified, and I just wanted to say, you know, I'm not speaking on behalf of Santa Barbara Unified, so whatever's public on their website is, I'm a teacher, I'm a part of their union, I do what I need to do, so I'll speak independently just as a member of the community, you know, parent and teacher, you know, this is a complex issue. I think the way Santa Barbara City College is approaching it with looking at safety and, and trying to bring students back wherever possible is the way to go, but at Santa Barbara Unified, uh, not everybody thinks that way. And so I, for one, I'm ready to go back to the classroom. The negative educational impact that this is having on students of color is to me unacceptable. And a lot of families are feeling that way. Locally, the homeschool community has grown to the thousands. So parents are not waiting around for public education to provide their needs anymore, which is unfortunate. Um, again, I mentioned earlier, so California community colleges are going to see the disparities of this. And unfortunately, it's, you know, if you have resources to get together a homeschool community or a pod, or if you have the resources to hire a credential teacher because you're allowed to homeschool your kids, all you have to do is hire a credential teacher. Well, there's plenty of credential teachers around um, in town that, you know, are you retired or whatnot. But then also a lot of them are getting taken up already because families are moving to that option. So I guess what I'm saying is that nobody has this perfect golden plan and teachers like Kate mentioned people earlier when you talked about opposing one thing or you know supporting thing teachers are deciding not to go back for different reasons and everybody has their right to do so it's a complicated issue I I think that the what all local education agencies should do is make this decision local uh, Northern California opened up a couple classrooms for kids in the spring because they knew this type of learning was just not working. Um, the Bay Area also. So I think that thinking creatively about this is the way to go. Um, and as Dr. Gazwami, you're taking safety first and uh, to set us up for success, I agree online is the way to go right now so that everybody can start off on the right foot. Um, I will say locally, the reason families are flocking to Santa Barbara City College from our local high schools is because we do have a robust online offering. It is organized. We actually have a pedagogy for online learning. We have a platform for online learning. We have all of the things that research shows is making students successful. And again, I'll say it, I've been hearing the comments this summer, students are traditionally 
were, have not been successful in online or were not successful in the spring at their high school are being very successful at our courses this summer. These are students as young as eighth grade is because our faculty have done an excellent job organizing courses and making online learning uh, possible. So anyway, I, I just wanted to say that it's not, not everybody's representative of the views you guys are hearing at Santa Barbara Unified. Parents and teachers are eager to get, do what we need to do that's right for students and families. Um, because as a California Community College, this K-14 pipeline, we're all connected. Um, so if we can figure out a way to get spaces to do this safely and spread us all out, and those of us that wanna stay home can stay home, and those that need to be at work, uh, can send their students somewhere or those that need to work in a physical way um, in a in a face-to-face -face area. Thank you, Veronica. Marcia, do you have an additional uh, comment? Well, I was just going to say I I, um, I really agree with what Dr. Goswami said. Testing is not available. We're not a priority. Um, they're, they're prioritizing testing. And the 10 to 14 day turnaround is not useful because it means you can't do the contact tracing in the time that you need to do to stop the virus. Um, so that's part of why we're in trouble. We're in trouble in the US. Testing has been an issue from day one and it still is. And when I talk about testing, I am talking about the kind of testing that is available and has a quick turnaround, not while it's not working. Um, and Frankly, I think if you back up, the situation is pretty simple. The situation is that until we have a vaccine, this doesn't go away. And a vaccine is not going to be approved, manufactured, distributed, and effective because it has been administered to enough people and the time elapse has happened until at least the end of next semester, spring semester. And I think consistent with what Jonathan was saying, we're better off saying, guys, focus on online. This is where we are in this pandemic. And until we have a vaccine, we should focus on online. And if in the interim, the testing situation gets better, then we would be in a position to perhaps safely do some additional things. But um, safety first is, that's what it means to me uh, to, to do it that way. Craig, you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I, I did just, I wasn't planning to, but I listened to what everybody said and kind of, I agree for the most part with what everybody said, um, except I do realize that there's two, there's two different thoughts. What Jonathan brought up, and I'll just say it's Jonathan's because he wasn't the only one, but um, that, that's talked that way up, that presented his point of view. Um, it's different ways to look at it. I can totally understand that it's very logical what Jonathan said. It's the type of approach that's commonly used by a, maybe the majority of, our, of the population. Um, <clears throat> however, um, I much more agreed with the way Dr. Goswami presented uh, the position and what we would do. Um, I, I believe that we have to consider more than more other factors um, with the spread of the virus, other factors with to consider that result from what we do by shutting things down. Um, I'm extremely, because I think this way, because I guess I'm extremely concerned uh, about the gap getting wider. You know, there's, there's got to be some way to minimize that impact. So two points. First, all these measures to, all these measures were taken to shut things down are really taken to control the rate of spread of the virus. The virus is still continuing to spread. It's just at a slower rate and the rate will go up and down as it moves. Um, what we have succeeded, and Marsha was 100% correct as far as I could tell, that it's gonna be quite a while before we actually get um, any kind of um, protection, a magic pill uh, to protect us. So. 
the virus will eventually make its rounds. It's going to go around. So if you're high risk, it's coming. It, whether it happens now or next year, it's coming uh, somehow. Um, but what we have been very successful in the sh with in the short run from what I've read is treatment. We are dropping the death rate. Um, we're doing really, really well at that. Um, so that's, that's a good part of the picture. Um, I, I have something in detail that I would like Dr. Goswami to, to check out. And that is, and I'll, I'll, I've been talking to a few people, but, you know, a lot of these students that are, that are disadvantaged, that are in danger of having problems, they're, uh, uh, and, and, and don't usually fare well or in their group, a, a higher percentage than in other groups, don't fare well with online education is um, <clears throat> is is multifamily housing units where there may be not just uh, multi generational but but two or even three families in a house or two families in an apartment um, we have lots of kids and people running around and interacting um, when those students and I know this because I spent time as a substitute teacher for a few years in the schools in the classroom. These students, they're as smart as any student, but they, they really, to do well, they have to make extreme sacrifices in order to find the time to be able to study uh, so that they can concentrate. Since we can't have cla in-person classes, I think the, if outdoor classes can be relatively safe, I'd say do them if we can. I, I like that idea. Um, I also wonder, but in detail, I wonder if, if we could look into ways to offer some kind of secure, clean space for people, for students that do not have a place where they can go and concentrate in order to study that has Wi-Fi. And these things are certain because they, they, for the most part, can't do it at home. Coffee shops are closed. Where are they going to go and use their laptops and have time to really concentrate and do it? So maybe we could make a difference um, to 10, 15% of those, of those people that are, or more of those people that, that are at risk or don't learn well online. If we could find some way to create areas or places that they can go to and do their online learning. So how do we accomplish that? So sorry, that took me so long to explain, but I got there. Thank you, Craig. Um, Marcia, do you have, is your hand still up from before? Do you have an additional comment? Um, I just short comment in Germany, you can get your test results in four hours. That's our problem, guys. It's not, Whatever. yeah. Um, if we had been able to handle it that way, we would not- You're right conversation you're and right when you, and when you have to wait uh two three days even uh for a test the test becomes almost meaningless because in those two or three days the person is out and, out and about infecting potentially infecting people so yeah. uh, that, that it's a huge huge problem so, and the whole idea of it, asymptomatic people who do not realize that they have this disease that, that's what i mean yeah I mean, that, that is a major trick of this virus. <laughs> so even before you get to contact uh, uh, tracing, just the fact it's delayed uh, is a huge problem. Dr. So, Goswami, did you So Trustee Nielsen has brought up a, a very pertinent point. It is something that, you know, at least I've been thinking about. We have been thinking about whether we can create spaces for students who don't have spaces. You know, uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, when you're doing work from home, a lot of, in a lot of families, there are seven or eight members crammed into two, two rooms. Yes. You know, and, and, uh, you know, and three of them are supposed to be studying. Uh, how does it happen? We have the luxury of going to our own corner, our own room and studying there, you know. Uh, so that is something if we have to, stay online for a long period of time 
uh, there is something we'll have to look into. You know, we have allowed, you know, and I shared data you know, last time around when we started the uh, our Wi-Fi on the parking lots as to how many students were parking the cars in the parking lots and doing some of the work. But then we did not open up our bathrooms. Okay. Because we had concerns about you know, the disease getting into our buildings and things of that sort. So all of those things, I think we have to, we have to you know, figure out you know, what are some of the ways we can, you know, because agreed that this will go on for a while. So we have to figure out how best to educate our students and not totally shutting down some things that are, you know, absolutely critical for the learning process. So, so it is possible that, you know, that we might have to be very flexible down the line in spring, that if we find a couple of windows in which we can do things physically, we may do things physically in that those three or four week window. So, so as we are planning, you know, when we are planning for fall, people who volunteer to teach face to face they were told right at the beginning that now, but remember, at any point in time, you might have to switch to online because that that was a distinct possibility. So no, so people, some people still volunteered that now they that they thought it was beneficial, uh, and they are willing to do that. But we're not forcing anybody to teach courses face to face, and and uh, same thing for planning for spring. I think you know. For spring, we'll probably end up making the call by by October. Not not a month in advance, just like this time around. But for spring, we'll probably end up making the call early October or middle of October because we'll pretty much know what's what's going to happen as to how how the metrics go. And and uh, so, I I am really concerned, uh, as many faculty are, um, about the. Uh, long-term impact on learning on number of our, you know, significant number of our students because it is just not the format that they're used to. Because remember the discrepancy that was 8% or 9% below the regular courses, those were voluntary students who wanted to take online, who were not forced to take online, okay? Now that we are forcing a lot of more students to online, those numbers are going to change significantly because those the discrepancy we saw at the beginning of the you know, this meeting those are students who are not forced into online they voluntarily took online who thought they could do very well online and still didn't do well uh, so so i know our faculty you know they are uh, talking about pedagogical approaches as to how to engage students better uh, they are trying their best. Uh, we will try to ramp up our services the best we can to serve students in an online format, the best we can, and then take advantage of any opportunities we can we get wherever it is, as long as it's safe, to to you know engage them, you know, uh, the best we can in the campus. But I don't see it happening very quickly, you know, in the next couple of months. Hey, Dr. Gaswamy, it's obviously a, uh, a very, very difficult uh, topic, something you, you never thought you would be dealing with when you joined us in January, but uh, here we are. Yeah. And, and our faculty and staff and, and you folks are also struggling with it, so it's not just, no. Uh, I think, you know. Uh, uh, yes, it, and we're not the only institution uh, it's being affected. I mean, it's businesses, schools, um, just up and down the line, the economy is being affected in ways we probably don't even appreciate at the moment. Um, so and thankfully, we have a three year average funding scenario. A lot of yes. businesses don't have that. Yes. That's the way to look at the bright side of things. <laughs> okay. You have to. So we've got um, maybe five minutes left. Um, board self-evaluation is the next item on the agenda, item 4.4. I'll just note that 
uh, BP 2745 requires that we do a board self-evaluation uh, once a year. We're required to do it by the end of June, so we're missing it by just a few weeks. I'll also note that a uh, several months ago, actually, back in April or May, a self-evaluation instrument was made available to every trustee, and I believe every trustee did eventually uh, complete it. And the results of that were provided in a 50 or 60 plus page uh, document that was uh, made available uh, for this agenda. So I would uh, open it up to any comments, questions, thoughts that anybody has on our uh, self-evaluation. I'm seeing none. <laughs> I, in, in looking through it, I'll just say that um, I didn't see any particular areas that were of alarming, unusual, unexpected. Uh, uh, mo most of the uh, most of the responses were more than a majority in agreement with the statements, and the statements were all, I think, almost exclusively positive things that, were, that we were being asked to react to, uh, things that we should be doing uh, and wanting to know uh, how we respond. So uh, the responses were primarily positive, uh, some more than others. Um, beyond that, I don't have any specific uh, comments to make as somebody else does. We have left uh, three items on the agenda, uh, 4.5, which is board and CE role, CEO roles, uh, 4.6, code of ethics, and 4.7, calendar uh, items. And I, I note that attached to 4.7 was a master planning calendar that was prepared, may have been prepared last year. Can, can you speak to that, Dr. Gazwami? Is, is, uh, yes, uh, and uh, what I was going to do was to suggest some additional items that we need to incorporate in the uh, in the uh, board planning calendar. Uh, so we will we can put it for discussion at the next board meeting. Uh, I can I can provide you the list also beforehand as to what are some of the things I thought I think that should be included in part of the planning calendar. So. We can have a you know, quick discussion on that at the next board meeting. Good, yeah. I don't think that this is time sensitive, and the other two items aren't time sensitive uh, either. The uh, review of the code of ethics, which is important, and the board and CEO roles is an important topic. So we can schedule it. So, so the, those two items we can do it at the next uh, whenever we do our next uh, what is it called uh, retreat, and on the calendar we'll put it on the board agenda for. August 13th. Okay. And, and then we can you know, prioritize as to what kind of items we'll bring before the board. You know. Okay. With, with that, I'm going to um, invite a motion to adjourn. Robert, I just, I had my hand raised, but you missed oh, it. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. So the I see only... there's three, there's three hands raised. <laughs> I was looking, uh, I, I was ignoring them. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, yeah. We will, we will adjourn, but for the, um, for the August 13th, the second half of the retreat, the only part of this agenda from the board goals, we should agendize that all over again because there was the question there, do you want to, do you think this goal should stay the same for next year? And so our board policy says that we have to develop our goals in consultation with the CEO president. And so if we don't agendize that, we won't be able to talk about it. No, I, I agree. Sure. The, the, the BP 20 seven, I forget the number 45, uh, requires that we do that by the end of August, so. So that'll be in the August uh, 13th meeting. Yes. Good. So then if we can just add that attachment again and then we yeah. can see. Yes, both. yes. Marasha, uh, Marcia? Um, just a couple quick suggestions on the um, board survey. Um, one is that we do our Brown Act training, um, which we normally did once a year. I don't think we've done it for a while. 
and that's helpful for accreditation, uh, among other things. And I know there's a number of online webinars and all kinds of things that we can do for self-study, which is, again, part of that package for accreditation. Um, I was going to suggest as well that people go back and read. And if you don't have it, ha ask Dr. Goswami to help you get the League's Trustee Handbook and the Financial Responsibility Handbook. Those are pretty informative, lengthy discussions of our uh, various tasks and obligations and roles. And I think those are all good things to, to do. So self-study right now is a good thing. Good idea. Thank you. I noticed there are a lot of webinars available um, on topics that are current too. There's a number of them dealing with uh, anti-racism and uh, obviously the pandemic and online instruction. So I would we, encourage people to take, take advantage of those. Yeah, we used to take track of this so that we could submit it as part of accreditation about the things that we had done. And I think that we might have some catch up to do, but that would be good. Uh, good idea. I've done a number that I don't think I have reported. So I, we, we should ask uh, uh, our, our new uh, uh, board secretary, Jasmine, to help us keep track of that information. Uh, Kate, did you have another? Yes, just quickly uh, uh, agreeing with the previous two comments and then also saying, you know, just with the board server, we just don't, we really don't have time to even start discussing it today. Um, and with that, I will move adjournment. Uh, before, is there a second? I second. second. Oh, Peter. Okay. If Veronica, your hand was still up. Did you have another? No, comment? I'm sorry. No, yeah. I was okay. seconding. Okay. Any, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. I could say no, but it would be a board decision to adjourn. Motion, <laughs> motion passes. Thank you, everybody. I thought it was a really good session. Thank, Thank you. you. Robert, are we planning a, a 